Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Rise of Corporate Ethics webinar by the ASEAN Human Development Organization, Foundation for International Human Rights, Reporting Standards, and the ASEAN University Network, as well as the Ethics Council and Advisory for the ASEAN region. The theme of this webinar is how companies in ASEAN are balancing purpose, profit, and people. On behalf of AUN, ADHO, Foundation for International Human Rights Reporting Standards, and ECAR, we are delighted to be hosting our second webinar this year. And we are extremely grateful to the audience for joining this webinar and participating diligently. We would also like to thank the speakers for taking time out to discuss the rise of corporate ethics. Before I introduce the speakers, I would like to kindly request the audience to fill out the quick questionnaire that should take less than a minute. You can scan the QR code that is going to appear on the screen uh, right now, or you can click on the link in the YouTube live comment box from the AUS Secretariat that's going to be pinned. So please fill it out right now before the program begins, as it will be extremely helpful for us to hear your thoughts on this topic. So you can take around a minute right now to fill it out. We will reveal the results of the questionnaire at the end of the session after all the speakers are finished with their talks. And that time we will let you know what the results are. During the duration of this webinar, if you have any questions at all, please feel free to write it in the comment box on the YouTube Live or the Zoom chat box. Finally, this webinar is recorded, so you can refer back to it at any time on the AUN YouTube channel. So now on to the agenda of this webinar. The purpose of this webinar is to answer the question, what challenges does the rise in corporate ethics bring to ASEAN and how are ASEAN companies meeting their ethical responsibilities? There will be three distinguished guests of honor for the opening remarks. Mr. Gil Gonzalez, the Executive Director of ASEAN Business Advisory Council, Mr. Lei Hong Puk, the Chairman of ASEAN Human Development Organization, and lastly, Mr. Thomas Thomas, the Chief Executive Officer of the ASEAN Corporate Social Responsibility Network. For the main session, we're delighted to be joined by six remarkable speakers. First, we have Dr. Wit Sun Taranun, the Executive Vice President for DTGO, who will talk about the ASEAN companies and international corporate ethic ranking. Then we will have Ms. Moon Ching Yap, the Executive Director of the Air Asia Foundation, who will discuss how ASEAN companies support social entrepreneurship and equal opportunity. Then we have Ms. Rajeshri Mogan, who the then we have Ms. Rajeshri Mogan, the Chief Human Resources Officer at Flow, who will speak about the new ethical roles in corporate HR. After that, we will have Ms. Shermini Lohadison, the Ethics and Compliance Manager of SNS, whose talk will be about corporate responsibility for ethics and compliance. Then we have Mr. Mikkel Larson, the Chief Sustainability Officer at DBS Bank, to give a talk on the rising ethical investment challenges of ASEAN companies. And finally, we have Mr. Arya Dwi Paramiti, the VP of Pertamina, and he will discuss how an energy SOE contributes to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. We are extremely pleased to have all these speakers here and can't wait to hear from them. Once again, we would like to sincerely thank both the speakers and the audience for joining this webinar. I hope by this time, the audience has filled out the questionnaire, either through the QR code or the link. If you haven't, then please do so right now as it will be extremely helpful to us. We are excited to hear the different sessions that the speakers have prepared and we, are ho and we hope that you are prepared too. Please feel free to ask any questions at any time through the comment box. We are excited to hear the different sessions the speakers have prepared. Now, without further ado, I would like to invite the moderator for the webinar, Dr. Bob Audrey. Dr. Bob is the Managing Director of Bob Aubrey Associations and the Strategic Advisor for the ASEAN Human Development Organization. He is also the founder of the Ethics Council and Advisory for the ASEAN region. So please welcome Dr. Bob. Dr. Bob, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Divani, uh, and welcome to everyone. Delighted to uh, have this great panel of speakers and thanks again to the panel. 
What we're talking about today is uh, ethics, and this is something that we have been discussing with this partnership of the ASEAN University Network, as well as with the uh, ASEAN, with, as well as with the Human Rights Reporting uh, 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 Council. With uh, and this is the second uh, that we have had. So it's the first one we're talking about: corporate ethics. Now, corporate ethics can be something that's very small, or it can be something that's very big. And it's not absolute. I mean, when many people think of business, you're thinking of greed, exploitation, corruption. So is business actually going to become more ethical? Well, what, we're, what we want to cover today is, not, is, is how business is looking at what is the right to do, right thing to do. And that is changing to a certain extent. But these people will be able to tell you how to do the right thing in a business environment as well. So uh, it's quite an interesting uh, topic that we'll be uh, covering. I'd like to just salute uh, so that if you can just turn on your camera so that uh, the participants can see who you are. Chongtas from uh, the AUN has been a, a partner in setting these things up. Dr. Chongtas, thank you very much for your help. Uh, Marzuki Darusman, who has been also our sort of mentor as well as a key, inspire, key inspi inspiration uh, who's done a lot of work in human rights. Marzuki, can you turn on your camera so we can see you? Uh, I'd also like to thank, uh, I don't think we have him on camera, but uh, Sanjaya Mulia from the ASEAN uh, Youth Organization uh, who has uh, invited uh, members to, to participate in this conference as well. Thank you all very much. Now, uh, we have uh, a different uh, a group of speakers and, uh, and, and we'll start with the opening speeches in a minute. Uh, we, we have a, a quite a few speakers. So we will be going through uh, about 10 minutes with each speaker so that you'll see this, the, the, the uh, different perspectives uh, as we go. And then I would like you to, as you're listening to these speeches, to write in questions and you can uh, post your questions, and then we'll pick some questions, but each question should be directed at a specific speaker. So as you're listening to that spe speaker, write the question for that particular speaker. Without further ado, I'd like to uh, invite our first opening address, Gil Gonzalez. Uh, can you turn on your camera and uh, please tell us how the uh, ASEAN Business Advisory Council is working on ethics. Good morning, Bob. Good morning, Gary. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? We can hear you, but uh, can't see you yet, or at least I cannot. Okay. Uh, well, I just turned it on. Okay. Thanks. Am I already there? I'll let you know when I can see it. Okay. But please go ahead and start speaking. Let's go ahead. Good morning, everyone. Uh, see you. Can you hear me now? You're, yeah, I can see you now. We can see you, you can hear you. Thank, Thank you. you, welcome, Gil. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, on behalf of ASEAN BAC, I wish to thank the Ethics Council Advisory for ASEAN Region and your collaborators for this kind invitation. The title of your webinar, The Rise of Corporate Ethics, is indeed very timely and opportune not because uh, corporate ethics is something that rises and falls every now and then, or that it suddenly appears when a big scandal explodes and slowly disappears when things are going nice and dandy, and of course when no one is looking. As we all know, the opposite of good governance is corruption. So let me start by saying that your webinar today provides us with an excellent reminder that corporate ethics should and must always be part of the equation, regardless of time and circumstances, on how corporates attain their goals and objectives, more so at this time of the pandemic, in balancing purpose, profit, people, when many corporates and businesses are on survival mode. The ethical compass of what is right and what is wrong must constantly guide every corporate action whether they may be operational or strategic concerns, and wherever the so-called new normality brings us. It must always point towards the common good, 
because what is good for stockholders and stakeholders in the end is good for the company, it's good for the CEO's management team, its workers, and it's most of all, its bottom line. Early on in my banking career, it was common industry practice, not just in banking. We're having a bit of a problem with the sound. So um, let's, uh, let's try again to see if we can connect with Gil. If not, I'll move on to the next speaker and then come back. Gil, can you hear us? Okay, let's, uh, let's then move on to our... Gil, are you there? I'm, I'm still here. Can you, okay. can you hear me? Uh, yeah. you, the, the microphone started breaking up, so we couldn't hear the last couple of sentences. Please go ahead. Okay. So I have seen the transformation. Okay, I think we're having a problem with the system. Uh, Gil, we're not able to hear what you're saying, but I think it may be the problem with everyone else as well. Uh, Gil, let me, let, okay. I can see you speaking, now I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Oh boy, okay. So, right. sorry. Back with us. So, line is quite bad. So. So yeah. the question today is how far can regulation-led transformation go? We've seen that it can go very far and deep with the passing of very strict laws and regulations to ensure fairness, transparency, and accountability to the point that it's timely the entrepreneurial spirit of businesses. Now, the governance space has expanded to what is called ESG, which includes not just governance, but responsibility for the environment and social issues towards sustainability. How Started private sector advocate go with the giving of awards, training for directors and independent directors go. In fairness, and corruptor finds a way around it, which reminds me of the movie Catch Me If You Can. Today, when the world is being ravaged by the COVID. Pandemic when massive stimulus fiscal packages are being released and acts like a virus. I just read Transparency International was asking, how do we ensure a corruption-proof system in the acquisition and equitable distribution of vaccines? Indeed, governments and multilateral governance infrastructures will again be put to a test, and we can only hope that it works. I'm sure that you will agree that good governance has become our corporate vaccine. Finally, the ASEAN BAC, together with ASEAN CSR Network and Thomas, who's with us today, is posing the question that perhaps it's about time we come together and to turn our attention to the MSMEs, which we claim to be the new engine of inclusive and sustainable economic growth for ASEAN. Is there a good governance scorecard applicable to F for MSMEs? Are business organizations and chambers of commerce pushing good governance principles and practices to their memberships? And lastly, are we pushing for good personal governance to ensure that our people look at ethics not just as a compliance requirement, but is in fact a way of life? How do we help ensure that our workforce do not suffer from split personalities where they act ethically inside a company and goes wayward outside, thereby dragging the name and character of their companies? How do we from the private sector work with ASEAN towards this end in putting the enabling policy environment to make ESG work and flourish? These are questions that will continue to challenge all of us, both private and government sectors, despite the fact that corruption can never be ultimately eradicated in anyone's lifetime. We do find strength and inspiration to see champions 
like ECAAR and its collaborators who are not intimidated, but will continue the fight to contain the poison and deadly reach of corruption by looking for best practice precisely in balancing purpose, profit, and people to protect and promote the common good. Thank you and have a productive webinar to everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gil. And sorry about the technical difficulty, but I think we were able to catch most of it. So uh, we are talking about, I liked what you said about governance and then the idea of personal governance, which is where we come back to this uh, idea of everyone uh, uh, with ethical behavior and how does that actually work in the workplace and with companies. Um, so uh, I think what we, what we can get from that is that ASEAN is starting to really focus on some of those key challenges and we're seeing more and more focus on ASEAN uh, by international companies around the world. I'd like to now uh, turn to Le Hong Fook, who has been one of our founders of a, a new organization called the ASEAN Human Development Organization, which is focused on people at work. So Fook, can you please uh, open, uh, open this dialogue about ethics from your point of view? Welcome. Thank you, Bob. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to present you for ASEAN Human Development Organization, ADO, uh, as uh, one of the organizers of uh, this webinar. For those who have not known much about ADO, uh, ADO was established in 2018 with the mission of promoting human development at work in the ASEAN region. Uh, to fulfill its uh, mission, ADO published research white paper, organized conference and event across the region, uh, work with international organization and manage regional certification program which is coming in the very near future for human development professionals. Founding member of ADO, including Indonesia, Vietnam, Malaysia, Singapore, and Myanmar. Um, in, the, in this slide, you will see that uh, although ADO was started by connecting the National HR Association in ASEAN countries into a community of professional, but uh, we are not just a regional HR community. ADO is promoting and leading the shift from human resource to human development in organization. HR now should not manage people as human resource. The traditional HR role and function seem to not fix with the, the changing environment today. Coming human development in the workplace means managing people as work as an end, as well as the mean of production in terms of the organization. Human development focuses on helping people widen their choices, work according to their aspirations, and improve their own well being, as well as their human capital. Next slide, please. So, in this slide, you will see that we are talking about ASEAN culture. Uh, would, uh, with each country in the region has its own culture value would contribute to the diversified of ASEAN culture. Uh, we have uh, selected some concepts that link to some ASEAN country. Uh, first, uh, you can see Sanuk, right? in, in Thailand, which means fun. Uh, in the workplace, Sanuk means maintaining interest, generating good feeling, and enjoying relationships in work teams and network. For Singapore, we should work class. Uh, because it's telling that this country is striving to reach work class in business. Uh, Kien Kern, right? Uh, this is a Vietnamese word, right? It means resilience. In local language, it's a combination of two words determined and strong. Taken together, they show the characteristics of the Vietnamese people, capability to step up to the challenge of change and draw on a powerful determination to success. Uh, Medica, linked to Malaysia. Medica means independence, but today in the workplace, it means that people demand to be respected and expect to have some freedom choosing or changing their employer to be self-employed or to start their own company. Uh, Malasakit, 
in Filipino, Malaysia kid means caring, compassion, or uh, empathy. At the workplace, it means the company and its manager to have to take care of the workers, but also the workers have to take care of the company, vice versa. Last but not least, Gotong Royong is an Indonesian concept, but also used in Malaysia and Singapore. That means mutual cooperation and working together. If you want to learn more about this, you can read the, in the book, Leading Human Developments in Asia, written by Dr. Bob Aubrey, our moderator, who is also the founder of AIDO, and uh, now he's a uh, chairman of the AIDO Advisory Board. Next, please. Uh, this is my last slide. And today in this webinar, we're talking about the rise of the corporate ethic in ASEAN, how company in ASEAN are balancing purpose, profits, and people. So the idea that work should be a vehicle for human development for everyone, that is no longer as a philosophical idea or a reality of a higher present, but in come to the real life. However, it is still rather new and is by no means a cheap uh, reality. That's why human development professionals have an ethical responsibility. We will, you will hear more about this in the, uh, this seminar. So the typical ethic challenge, uh, we see that they, first of all, they, they the the co corporate purpose, how corporate balance, purpose, profits, people, uh, ethical leadership role in human development, the fairness, the diversity and inclusion in organization. We'll talk the, the challenge in the lifelong learning and employability. Contingent workforce is also another issue. In many places in the world now, people are still that debating that the contingent workforce is a company full-time worker or contract worker and they how we develop them to develop their career. Uh, ethical use of technologies, technology change the way we live, the way we work, the way we develop. And last but not least, the human sustainabilities. I believe that the corporate ethic is always an important matter and I hope the following presentations from our speaker today will address as much as I can. Uh, I have only five minutes, so I, that's I have for you. Thank you for your attention and enjoy the webinar. Thank you very much, Fook, and uh, thanks for your contribution to getting this uh, ethics of human development uh, well-defined uh, for specifically ASEAN business and, uh, and for the culture. So um, thank you very much. We'll come back to you on uh, hopefully on some questions. I'd like to turn now to someone who was an early founder of an ASEAN entity, Thomas Thomas, uh, and I think all of you have heard uh, about corporate social responsibility, uh, usually abbreviated as CSR in companies. What does it mean and what does it mean for ASEAN? Thomas, you can tell us. If anybody can tell us, you can, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, thank you, Bob. Uh, could I just be allowed to use, share my screen, please? Uh, okay, uh, while they get my... Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, well, good morning, and uh, thank you very much for uh, this opportunity to thank, to join you in this uh, uh, event and share some thoughts. Um, I'm, uh, I compliment you all for the great work that you are doing, and um, let me just uh, share some thoughts. We can see the slides this. now, Thomas. Okay, thank you. Um, I will just first start off with ASEAN CSR Network. We were formed in December, 28th of December, as a network of networks to promote responsible, inclusive business in ASEAN. And we are an ASEAN entity. At the same time, as Gil has introduced, uh, we work with uh, ABAC as the champion for responsible, inclusive business. And our idea is to promote responsible business, ASEAN, to make ASEAN a better place for everybody to live in. And um, together with uh, Gil and uh, uh, the ASEAN Business Advisory Council, we have now moved on to get an initiative we call the ASEAN Responsible Inclusive Business Alliance, which is uh, getting businesses to join this journey. 
and to, to tell exactly what is responsible inclusive business, we have got a, uh, we have this vision that we want to create a world where responsible inclusive business is uh, uh, is the reason why companies can become successful, and that you create a powerful positive impact on the triple bottom line of profit for the planet, which the earlier speakers have mentioned. Uh, but we also said that part of this responsible is to talk about values and principles. And we have uh, used terminologies to, to capture these uh, seven values and principles that all establishments should work on. It's accountability, transparency, ethical behavior, respect for stakeholder interest, respect for the rule of law, respect for international norms of behavior, and to treat people with respect, dignity, and fairness, which is what ASEAN HR HDO is also trying to do with other organizations. And we also said you should talk about subject areas, which are the subjects of responsible governance and uh, environment, labor, anti-corruption, human rights, consumer, community involvement and development. We also said that governance is the key. If you don't have good governance, nothing else works. If governance is good, then you can at least measure properly, you can implement, and you've got the right keys. Having said that, then I ask this question, what is ethical behavior? For business, it's the behavior that is with accepted principles of right and good conduct in the context of particular situation is, is consistent with international norms of behavior. So I would like to say it's contextual because values uh, do change time and where you are. And sometimes it's a choosing of the leaders and it's consistent with expectations of what is right and wrong. So we will have to talk about ethical behavior must be based on the values of honesty, equity, and dignity. And ethical behavior implies that you are concerned for people and animals, the environment, and you have a commitment to address the impact of your activities and decisions on stakeholders. This is exactly what uh, Gil and Mr. Pock has said earlier. So the outcome is actually you build trust. Uh, I also said you cannot, organizations are made of people, leadership is made of people. And unless you have ethical uh, behavior of the individual, it's difficult to have organizational uh, ethics. And so I would basically say the rule that we go on ethical behavior for organizations, for people is the golden rule. Do unto others what you would have others do unto you. This is in all the religions. This is quoted from the Bible, but there's similar things in like Confucius teachings, in Buddhism, in Islam, in Christianity, uh, sorry, in Sikhism, Hinduism, every other religion. Uh, so it's doing the right thing because it's right. It's not doing the thing because it's good for PR, it's good for image, it's good for making money. So I also want to say that ASEAN actually has a goal on integrity, but ethics, and the last part of breaking on ethics, values, and cultures of integrity is linked very much to corruption. So ASEAN has, all the ASEAN com companies in, in the first uh, paragraph has uh, implemented, adopted, uh, rectified the ASEAN UN Convention Against Corruption. And uh, there are rules to go in, but how are they progressing? If you look at the uh, transparency index um, slides, we do not, except for Singapore, Brunei, uh, some extent Malaysia, the, uh, most of the other countries are among the lower end of the uh, index. So ASEAN, although we have aspirations, we have not done. How does ASEAN companies relate to this? Uh, the ASEAN CSR network together with NUS and this time with uh, the, the Securities Investors Association of Singapore. Uh, with NUS and ACN, ASEAN, we have been doing this study in 2016, 2018, and the latest in 2020. It shows very clearly that while disclosures on integrity, business integrity has improved, it is still not good enough. It is not good enough. It's still very much on PR, publicity, codes of conduct, but implementation, teaching things, whether you're implying it for directors, there are still gaps. So a lot more can be done for this. So going forward, one of the best ways uh, we think that it is uh, through Ariba, uh, which gets, because you need collective action. We can't, it's harder to be clean in a dirty world by yourself, but if we have 
to if we can work together to talk about ethical behavior, it helps. I have, uh, I think all of us, have that. I'm not going to go along how exactly you can do because there will be companies and corporates who are giving the actual examples and the hows and the whys, uh, how can we, but it is ultimately good for us. And I'll end with this quote from Mr. Gandhi, uh, Mohandas Karmachun Gandhi, who said, when uh, seven things that work with, uh, that can destroy us, is wealth without work, pleasure without conscience, uh, knowledge without character, religion without sacrifice, politics without principle, science without humanity, and business without ethics. And actually all the others shows that without ethics, actually it destroys the world. So I uh, compliment again for working on this and thank you very much for this opportunity and very happy to work with you all to promote this ethical conduct, which is still a big area to work on. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. And uh, I salute you for being one of the pioneers of, of ethics uh, in, in ASEAN. You've, uh, in, in, in the, your presentation, you clearly defined the responsibilities that we have uh, and gave us references uh, through ASEAN declarations. And you also pointed out that we still have challenges. And that's exactly why we want to have this seminar is, uh, or this webinar is to discuss uh, where we are in terms of the challenges in ASEAN. Now, now we're are going to be moving to the, we're going to take a picture. So uh, can I turn to our master of ceremonies? You're going to, to, to use the camera at this point? Yes. Devani, can you go ahead? Uh, if everyone could kindly turn on your camera, so then we can all take the group picture. Um, so yeah, I'll just wait for everyone to turn their cameras on. Okay, perfect. Uh, so I'll count to three and then just keep smiling for around five seconds so that uh, we can capture the screen. Um, I think Mr. Mar Marzaki is- Marzuki? yeah. Can we see you? Okay, perfect. Okay, uh, so one, two, three. Okay. Perfect, I think we got the picture. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thanks to uh, our leaders for opening this session. And now what we're going to do is to move into the realities of people that are actually uh, responsible for different aspects of ethics and ethical behavior in ASEAN. Uh, and uh, one of the things that I didn't know until recently is that there are organizations that, that uh, rank ethical companies and that they give awards to ethical companies. I, I learned this from an uh, international company called 3M. Uh, you all know from uh, what's been happening in the United States with the Black Lives Matter movement that companies in America have really started to focus on racial equality, et cetera. And 3M uh, created a position uh, as director of social justice. The problem that they had at 3M was uh, you know that we don't have a Black Lives Matter issue in in Asia, but we have a lot of ethical issues in Asia. So uh, we had a, a webinar on that, and that's how I got to learn about it. What I didn't know even then was that there are ASEAN companies on those lists uh, uh, who are awarded as being highly ethical companies. And our first speaker, our first panelist, is representing one of those companies. So Dr. Witt, uh, tell us what is an ethical ranking? How did you actually become a, an award winner? And uh, uh, what, what, can you, what kind of message can you give to, uh, to the others about uh, these ethical rankings? Please go ahead. Thanks, Bob, and then hi, everyone. And let me, before going into the point of talking about the, the, the ranking, about ethical ranking, I would like to briefly mention about who we are so that it provides everyone a context of why we are here today. And then please go on to the next slide. I'd like to show the, the mission, our first mission since the beginning of, of an organization in 1993. It stated clearly that we are working to nurture children in need of a better quality of life. 
So with this kind of mission, everyone would think that we would have been a charity, but please go on the next slide. But when we think clearly about being a charity and supporting uh, children in the long run, we are talking about supporting one life uh, for many years. For example, if you are talking about uh, a student who are in grade one now, and you would like to support that child until they reach a university level, it means that we talk about 15, 16 years from now. So how come a typical charity to get a, to secure their income from the donation for 16 years, it's so incredible. So when we think about that, then how can we run a typical charity for sustainable giving? The next slide. So now we think about how we can to do make doing good as our business and run for sus, sus, for sustainability. Then next slide, please. So this is about structuring our organization so that we can we can really do that. So we have separate our organization into two 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 sections: business section and social section. And why they are also integrated. So for our business, we aim at doing our good business through our property development. So all the product and services that we make, they have to be attached to uh, our philosophy of good for all beings in this world. For all beings mean human and environment and all the animals. And then we aim at providing healthy living, value creation, and sustained innovation for all the stakeholders. And what's more important is about ethical integrity, that everything that we are running, and then we all know that the, for the property business in Asia, it's not easy to be ethical, especially when you have to deal with the, 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 the officials and the governments. So it is very challenging for us to set a stance on this. But for 28 years, we have been standing on firm on, on not being supporting a corruption. And then we do that. We have been doing that for, for 28 years and we can now still on business. And with that, then we are thinking about doing this business and providing 2% of our top, top line revenue to support our social causes, to support the charity of supporting the children in need. This will ensure that we have a long-term uh, funding for our philanthropy and all the creating shared value programs. So talking about that, this is another point that we have been recognized by the, the Ethisphere, the, the organization uh, that promote the ethical behavior and, and, and give out the, the, the award about the ethical companies. So those 2% top line revenue, what is important about that? It means that even in the bad year where we run loss in our balance sheet, we still need to contribute 2% of our revenue for charity. So it doesn't matter whether we get profit or we get loss. So that means it's a commitment for every year that we can have a continuous funding to our social contribution. And I'm lucky that I'm in, in this organization taking charge, take in charge of social contribution because I'm not don't have to be get headache about about uh, uh, running the business, but rather than rather rather to think more about creating the impact and make sure that all the money that we have are well spent to serve people in need. And next slide, please. So that means DTGO is about the company that, uh, that run the structure as business social integration. So, so we both aim for making a good business as well as creating impactful social contribution. And with the commitment um, to benefit others as the, our ultimate aim. So ethic is an underlying philosophy as stated by our senior chairman, Kuntanin Chirvanon. 
that we have to benefit people at large and society we live in rather than ourselves. And next, and that is also confirmed by the vision set by our founder, Kun Tipapon Ariyavararom, that we would like to be a global evolving and living organization that fosters a community of smart and good hearted people who care for the world at large. So, move on to the next slide. So with regards to the recognition as an ethical companies, and uh, it is my personal opinion that it is not about making our policies and plannings and do the measurements and then reporting, communicating of what we have done. Those are important for the ranking, of course. And, but I don't think that is the most important thing because for our ASEAN companies, Asian culture reflects uh, our compassion. When we talk about doing good, we don't, talk, we don't think much about that, but we rather using our heart than using our head. So being that, I think this is a really, really good foundation for ethics and the charity in, in Asia. And I would like to highlight that, that if we keep doing that and together with improving our policy development, our implementation plan, our monitor and evaluation of our impacts, and lastly about communicating our practices that would serve the, for any company in Asia to be able to be ranked in a global standard like uh, the world's most ethical companies. So I'm, I'm not saying that we are perfect in this stance, but we are so improving, as I said, but what is important is about doing, not the planning. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Witt. I have a question for you. Why, why did you join this company and why are you so involved in ethics? Uh, can you give us a little bit of a personal um, a testimony? Oh, I have to say that um, I'm lucky that uh, I got this turning point in my life to change from our, my previous uh, lives, working mm -hmm. on the, the Actually, my background is in chemical engineer. So I, I taught in university for 10 years uh, in the right. engineering school. And then I moved on to, to doing the environmental safety and community development with the Thai conglomerate. And then move on to do the sustainability development. And with that in mind, I come to the conclusion that, that, that regardless of what you're trying to do in promoting, in in trying to make benefit to others, but your heart is very important. The commitment, the belief in the good is very important. So with the top leader who is very committed to, to do this by heart. So that's why I very appreciate DTGO for, for making this happen and really being an example for other companies too. Thank you, Dr. Witt. And uh, very interesting to look at uh, a company which is doing top line. In other words, they take 2% off at the, at the top to be able to be sustainable about their ethics. I also like the word ethics is about doing and not planning. Uh, and then that we have this whole uh, idea of is ethics something that is by the founder and the leader or is it something that's embedded in the company itself? And so we turn to our next panelist, which is uh, uh, a company that all of you know, Air Asia. And uh, I think many of you know that Air Asia is a very typically ASEAN company in terms of its culture, in terms of its uh, HR, in terms of its leadership, et cetera. Maybe uh, you don't know that there's also a quite a powerful uh, Air Asia Foundation. And I believe that Manching was the first executive director. So you've been there from the beginning, right? Uh, and so can you tell us how this works together with a company that is providing ethics as not only part of its culture, but also as a foundation? Please go ahead. Thanks, Bob. Um, morning, everyone. Um, well, I'll start a little bit with my own introduction. So uh, I used to be a journalist before I joined AirAsia. And uh, through a very serendipitous meeting, I 
uh, was um, appointed to be Erasure's head of uh, Erasure's root planner at the time. Uh, this was back in 2004 when we were starting the network. And I had the pleasure uh, and the privilege of you know, spending four years expanding the root network and in the process getting to know ASEAN very well. Um, you know, after four or five years doing that, I decided I wanted to have a change. As somebody who comes from a journalism background, I wanted to do something that was more socially inclined. So I took some time off and decided that I think um, I want to work in government. I spent a year in government and I came across Tony again and you know, sort of shared some of my thoughts with him. And he suggested, you know, why don't you start Erasure Foundation? Um, he hasn't been happy with the way we were doing our social responsibility for a long time. I mean, we were, at the time, AirAsia was getting uh, emails every week from somebody saying, oh, please give me a free flight for this and free flight for that. Um, but we weren't having any impact in any area whatsoever. So, um, so he sent me a task. What I had was I had time to really look through the company. I knew the company very well from the, in terms of its network and its resources. So... Um, what we then decided was we would set up the foundation to support social entrepreneurship. So if you could go to the next slide. Next one. All right. So this is where we started. Um, when we talked to Tony, one of a couple of things that he shared. First, AirAsia is really a self-starter. Um, we came from a position of a company that was challenging all the big carriers. And uh, it was a tough struggle. And one of the things that he's really said would, that would have been really good if uh, we had more support in terms of a company that was starting up. Um, so one of the areas that we wanted to look at was how we can support small businesses that were trying to grow. And the second thing is really, we don't know enough about social causes, but social entrepreneurship back in 2012 uh, was really gaining more momentum in the region. Um, so we thought that was really great because, you know, if we can help people build better businesses, then the social entrepreneurs can take care of the social purpose and um, that's where their strength is and we just help them improve their businesses. So next slide, please. So from a stand, business standpoint, this is what we have, right? So from a brand relevance, it fits with our uh, ethos, basically an entrepreneurial company, an innovative company, a self-starter company. So in that sense, the course fits with our brand. But on the other hand, we also know that all these social enterprises produces goods and services. And how do we fit these goods and services into our network? Uh, can we use them in our supply chain? Can we use them in our communications material? Can we support them through our huge buying capacity uh, and the network? So that was the other area that we were looking at. Next, please. So in essence, this is what we do. Um, I started the foundation in 2012 and we started with a grant program. So originally it was just meant to be a grant program. Um, and we were looking to fill a gap because we found that a lot of social enterprises would get angel investment to start up. And thereafter, after two years, when they run off that money, they, they collapse because most of the funding focus was on the startup phase, but very little on the growth phase area. So what we did was we specifically targeted organizations that have already started up, would have two years of track record to show that there is something that you know, has potential to grow. And that's where we come in, we give them some funding. Um, they use that money over a year to whether invest in, in some equipment or they you know, train more people. But the other part of it also turned out to be really important important, which is the business mentorship part, because we found that although a lot of organizations knew what they need to do technically, they didn't know what to do to reach their market. Things like branding, marketing is always neglected, and they weren't able to reach their market as a result. So we used our networks to expand that. So we linked them up to our own internal design people, marketing people. We also linked them to AirAsia partners. Um, and then we started purchasing things directly from them as well. So it kind of creates a loop and they have different tools that we could use to support the social enterprises. So um, overall, in the last uh, nine years, we just celebrated nine year anniversary this year, we supported about 30 organizations, 30 grants in seven countries. And the diversity was very important because AirAsia is an ASEAN company. So we try to spread as far widely as possible with now grants in seven countries. And we work through intermediaries to reach people who are not urban base. So we work with intermediaries to get rural grants as well. So we have been, you know, fortunate to be able to grant uh, organizations in Vietnam, in Sapa, in Thailand, in the Hill Tribes, um, in five different cities across Indonesia, 
So th that's one of the things that was very important for us that we also reach people who don't speak English, but we find a way to reach out to them. Um, the other one is gender diversity. We also ensure that we have a good balance. So 50% of our grant organizations are um, run by women, not just benefiting women, but run by women. Um, next slide, please. So here are some of the grants. I won't go into all of them. They're all in the website, but these are specifically how I group them according to the goal uh, that they choose to, to, to address. So the five areas that we look for when we give a grant is what's the social cost, how many people they benefit, um, what's their innovation? You know, they, they, it doesn't necessarily need innovation in terms of technology, but how are they doing things differently that would make a difference to their business? Um, and sustainability, you know, one of the things that we found was that this so the idea of sustainability is so misunderstood. People think that sustainability, some, some organizations think sustainability means, oh, I can continuously rely on grants, but then we have to also have an educational program. We did a program at universities um, that also try to educate what financial sustainability means to generate your own income, to have social sustainability as well. And lastly, we also look at how we can link them up in different areas of the AirAsia network. So um, next slide, please. So these are some that also work on traditional trades. So we can see um, that's a huge tribe um, lady from Sapa. We work with um, Cambodian dancers. So all these are content as well for Air Asia because we were in travel um, and this was really, really um, fruitful area for us to tap. We share these content on our social media. People get to know about them as well. That helps them. Um, next, please. And the last one more and more uh, are the grants that are coming in from organizations that work on an environment challenge or uh, address climate change. Um, so this is an area that is getting to be more important as climate change become a bigger big, and bigger issue in our portfolio as well. Um, next, please. So these are some of the ways that we have been introducing the items from the social enterprises into our supply chain. So um, on the left, you see it's a coffee farmer from Northern Thailand. Um, he's from a hill tribe called Musa. So one of the things that he did was to rehabilitate, encourage the hill tribe to rehabilitate the national park area by giving them an alternative. So the alternative is to grow shade grown coffee. So it's coffee that grown under a canopy of trees, which means they have to rehabilitate the forest in order for them to grow this coffee. So it has worked very well hand in hand uh, between income for the hill tribes as well as the environment uh, importance of rehabilitating these hill slopes. And what we did was we've been selling his coffee on board our aircraft. Um, so that's one, one um, experience. We help him rebrand. He sells also in supermarkets now in Bangkok as well as coffee shops. Next, please. And we also start to integrate different products from ASEAN artisans because we wanted to differentiate the in-flight shopping from uh, the usual experience of just buying perfumes and cigarettes and, and you know, or, or, or jewelry from, you know, these established brands. We wanted to give a platform to ASEAN artisans. So we have silver from traditional silversmiths from Kota Gede in Indonesia. We have weaves from uh, Philippines. And these are all spread through different types of AirAsia channels, not only on board, it's on our online channels, it's on uh, different, uh, we also integrate these in our own corporate buying as well. Um, so next, please. We have about two minutes left. So a lot of this content is used in our marketing. So we have organized different types of events together with the social enterprises, which presents um, a very rich um, um, experience of ASEAN as well. So next, please. Um, and the last thing that we, most recent thing we've done is we actually set up a special um, a shop for social enterprise products um, because a lot of them were asking us if we could sell these items on, on board and you know there are limitations on that so we now have a dedicated shop just for social enterprise products. You can skip the next two slides please, you can go to the challenges. Yeah, so I think Bob asked me to address a bit about the challenges of doing what we do. The first thing is, of course, scaling. Uh, social enterprises itself are small and they need a lot of help in order to supply to a big company. So internally, even when AirAsia purchases from them, I have to do a lot of intervention to ensure that you know, they could 
end up supplying to the company. So one of the things that we, you know, I would love to see is more companies do the same as well. Um, so some examples uh, is in the US, they, uh, Cook County in Chicago, for example, has a government procurement preference for social enterprises, whereby if bids are 5% higher for social enterprises, they still have preferential uh, access to gain to win these contracts. The second challenge is, of course, a matter of corporate priorities and scale. Although we try our best to be as ethical as possible, there are plurality of views and not everybody sees it that way. So in terms of AirAsia Foundation, currently because of the very difficult situation that we have, funding is definitely a problem. So in a way, I foresaw that. That's one of the reasons why we started the shop so that the shop itself could continue the work that we do, which has been the case throughout this pandemic. But hopefully, we do hope that eventually it will earn enough to return a profit that we can then plow back into our grants independent of uh, corporate funding. So that's uh, the second challenge that we typically face. So I will end here and I uh, hope that we can pick more of these issues up in the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Moon Jing. That, that was a, a very broad overview. So uh, according to the question that, that, that Dr. Witt uh, was raising, which is how do you make this sustainable? A company like AirAsia has been very, very hard hit by the COVID pandemic. Uh, how, do you, how do you make this sustainable in this context? Yeah. To the, to the store, actually, we one of the things that social enterprises need is not so much the grant funding. They just need to be able to sell. So we have been doing this through the store. So the store itself doesn't need additional funding other than, you know, it doesn't fully meet its, it doesn't fully break even right now, but it's a small amount of money uh, that we can still sustain from our reserves. So we continue to help a lot of social enterprises uh, sell until a point that we can revive the grant program and expand the shop. So we're looking at different commercial platforms, including one on sustainable travel that we can start later on since the pandemic has limited international travel and we are all now focused on community-based travel. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Muching. Now, uh, for the audience there, I can see uh, we want you to ask questions. So you can please uh, type in your questions. We've, we've talked with Dr. Witt. Uh, about a, a company that has won an award as an ethical company. We've talked about with Moon Ching about the Air Asia Foundation. So please go ahead and ask questions because once we finish with this, the, the, the first presentation, we're going to come back and go through and ask specific questions of them. Okay, so don't hesitate to ask your questions. We'll be looking for them. Now, I'd like to turn to uh, a, a new source of uh, ethics. Well, it's an old source, but it's a, a lot of new things are happening in the, in the world of HR these days uh, because we see new titles that you probably don't even know about, uh, like uh, DEI. Uh, we have uh, CSR, which you've already, uh, which we've already seen with, with Thomas Thomas. Sri Mogan, uh, has been in HR and, uh, and so she's been personally involved in setting up some of these functions. And so I've asked her to talk about the ethical roles of corporate HR so that we can talk about whether there's an actual change in HR and what's, what's, what's going on in how companies manage people ethically. Shri. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Bob. Hi, everyone. Um, you can call me Shri. Um, and I'll just I'll wait for my uh, uh, slides to be coming up. Um, so I think just to just to kick off, I just wanted to share a little bit about my journey and about me. Right. So uh, next slide. So as you can see, there's a really awkward picture of me on the top left hand side of the screen. Um, a, a little bit of background about me. I am a third generation Indian Singaporean. Um, I, I studied, um, I did my degree and uh, London School of Economics and Accounting and Finance. And I did my master's in tri-sector collaboration, which is a very interesting program, which looks at the intersections of uh, workings in terms of government, civic society, as well as corporates, right? Um, uh, some of the names that you see on the screen are the companies that I've had the pleasure and the great opportunity to work for. Uh, and also I have been involved in helping youths actually set up social enterprises here in Singapore in the past with a startup that I and two other dear friends of mine had started. Um, and, and before I sort of go into sort of uh, ethics development of DEI and, and more of that uh, in the various sort of companies I've worked for, I just want to talk about the company that I'm, that I'm currently with. So next slide. 
Oh, okay. Um, I, I don't think I see the slide here, but uh, anyway, I I am currently actually with Flow, uh, which is also previously known as Asia Collect. It was founded in 2016. Uh, Flow is in, in, in the business of revolutionizing debt collection in Asia, focusing on ethical and digital debt collection through customer-centric operational process uh, using AI tech. Uh, we were founded in 2016, as I mentioned, we're operating right now in Vietnam, Indonesia, and India, and we are looking to expand in three other countries in, in the coming uh, one to two years. Um, one, of, one of the things I wanted to talk about before I you know, sort of focus on what are the new areas within human capital or HR, as we call it, is to look at where we started, right? And that's why I've used Dave Aldrich's model of HR roles here. Um, this model was founded somewhere about 20 years ago, and it was really based on the notion of separating HR policymaking and administration and business, part business partner roles. The ultimate goal was to shift the role of HR from administration to strategy. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how far we have come along that lines. And what you see on the screen is really the four different segments within the model. Uh, and that's a great point that uh, Oldrich mentioned, right? Which is, this is a great starting point, but you know, as anything else, the reality is a, a lot of these things are a lot more nuanced than what it looks like. Um, next slide. All right. so. Okay, um, what I wanted to talk about a little bit more is really how the HR function has evolved, right? And I think there's uh, quite a bit of changes that has taken place. So if, if you were to look at things, um, well, one of the interesting things is of course, digitalization, um, data and technology and how that has impacted HR. And I think the main focus for today is really how do we as a HR function, as a human capital function, help business identify what is social impact and social commitment to the society as a business. Uh, this is a big, hairy question to address. And I, I think one of the things that people see or may not see is what happens on the background in this function that might support some of this. And again, with my experiences in both MNCs and startups, the evolution has really been very different. Um, so next slide. Sorry, previous slide. Yes, so this is one of the things I wanted to talk about. And as Bob mentioned, and some of these words, you've already had some of the speakers um, before me mention, right? So diversity, equity, and inclusion is really, is so, um, I would say it covers various aspects, right? So diversity, equity, and inclusion and justice covers many things. So we're talking about not just gender, we're talking about the rights of disabilities, we're talking about LGBT um, and you know, single parents, what are the benefits that's related to them? Are we, are we an equal um, opportunity employer? This is a huge spectrum. Um, and I will touch briefly upon how this is sort of developed within MNCs and how it's different for startups. But in this area in itself, um, you know, different companies have different stands in which they want to sort of support. And I think one of the key things that I have been personally involved is really to think about what does DEI mean to a company and how do we really develop sort of, uh, I would say, training and development materials and educate the employee population and senior leaders around this, right? So as I mentioned, there are various areas to look at. You know, unconscious bias training is just one of the many things that companies have been doing. Um, I had the, the pleasure of actually having to do that for my previous company that I've worked in. I've also been with MNCs where they're a lot more structured in terms of the types of policies they're supporting and benefits that they're rolling out, right? Uh, CSR, as you all know, and uh, I think uh, Thomas, the previous speaker has mentioned, is really about self-regulating business model that helps a company uh, be socially responsible to itself and to the stakeholders and to the public. And last but not least, um, sustainability is uh, an area that, that I think will be covered later in the talk as well, where we're really talking about the management and coordination of environmental environmental and social financial demands um, to ensure that we're being responsible, ethical, and to also ensure the ongoing success of the business, right? A lot of people refer, uh, refer to this as the triple bottom line. And I put data as sort of the area underlying all of this because 
data, while um, is something that HR has depended on to make a lot of these decisions, not just in recruitment or company ban, but in these new areas as well. For example, ESG reporting um, is something that is new, uh, at least for the HR department. And I'll explain why I'm highlighting this, because in MNCs and in startups, where these three areas are parked is often quite different. Uh, with startups, you would see that DEI um, and you know, CSR could be with HR. In some smaller startups, sustainability could also be with the human capital and human resources team, uh, whereas in more established, bigger firms, they actually have solo teams that are actually working on this, which could be separate from HR. Um, data, I think from a functional perspective for HR, we are still in the process of trying to make sense of data for a lot of things, right? Um, how do we better utilize data in terms of identifying attrition, in terms of identifying uh, in different sort of organizational design, and how do we design different levels against for MSCs and for startups? So imagine that for this area, which is uh, within these three areas, data is still new to us and we're figuring out how we can better build some of these reports that make sense internally and externally to the public as well. Uh, next slide. So just wanted to, I mean, this is no uh, surprise to anybody, but I did want to you know, highlight a little bit on the startups within Asia. As you can see, the reason why I'm mentioning this is because I think Within ASEAN and Asia, we have a lot more startups that have started, you know, coming up from 2012 or even prior to that. Uh, next slide. Uh, these are some, uh, sorry, I think there was one other slide that could be missing. Okay, that's fine. Um, I'll just talk through it. Uh, sorry, I'll just talk through it then, no worries. So, uh, in, in ASEAN itself, of course, we have many companies that have started up recently, right? And, and even in the past, I would say five to eight years or so. So one of the things that I wanted to highlight and talk about is really the differences or what are some of the um, unique points of MNCs versus startup? Um, again, here, I think there's been some formatting issues. Sorry about that, everyone. I'm just going to, just to highlight what you see on uh, the left side is my points on MNCs and on the right side is being on startups. So what I have noticed is that, of course, with MNCs, given the tenure and what they have done and being around in the market for longer, there's a lot more processes and procedures um, that are more standardized. And of course, there's got a lot more robust sort of policies backing them up. Whereas with startups, we are learning as we go along, right? So we're dealing with a lot of ambiguity, connecting the dots as we go along as well. Uh, development, learning and development is very structured within MNCs, whereas with startups, it's, I would say, um, learn on the go, learn on the job. You learn from your mistakes. Growth is also very much planned and structured, whereas with startups, it's hyper growth. And again, and with MNCs, it's a lot more hierarchical in terms of, uh, you know, what you expect in a company as opposed to roles in startups being very inflated. I mean, my personal experience, I had to multi-head uh, at any given point in time, two to three roles and over two to three years in a startup is a long time. So a lot of things change around the way. And I think HR would have to deal with all of this. And that's why there needs to be uh, agility in terms of how we handle a lot of things around, you know, org design in terms of comp and ban. And also talking about contingent workers, right? We're also talking about the, the future of work. Um, how do you come up with policies and benefits for contingent workers, which is a big space that a lot of um, human capital professional needs to think about. Do we leave them out of our development area where they're such a key integral part of the business? That is, you know, it's a hard hitting topic and a difficult topic to discuss as well, uh, but certainly something that we need to think about as we move along. Uh, next slide. Um, just to focus a little bit more on the challenges that I see within, in a sort of HR and human capital in um, ASEAN, I think it's really about growing the thought leadership and building the expertise. So the reason why I'm saying this is because uh, there's so many labor laws that are, you know, it is integral for us to work in this in these countries. But someone who, for example, we have many startups that could be based out of Singapore, but could be operating in Vietnam 
India, Indonesia, and the need for us to understand them, right? I think that's key and it's important. And for in relation to this particular topic, for uh, DEI, for example, what is relevant from a DEI standpoint in one country may not be to another. And a strong point that um, I want to highlight as an example is LGBT. So it is a very touchy topic in uh, Singapore and as, as well as what in a few other LGBT? countries. What is so it? for those of you who may not know LGBT, DQ, that is uh, lesbians, bisexual, gays, transgender, queer. I think I've, that's that's everyone that I've captured. Thanks, Bob. Um, so that is a that's a very interesting topic, right? And that is certainly one of the groups that we look at when we are looking at diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, again, in Singapore, it's a very touchy topic, as well as I believe in some other ASEAN countries and Asia countries. So as a company that's operating in ASEAN, how do you then deal with policies or benefits around this area. Again, it's it's touchy, but it's something that as companies growing in the region, we need to think about, to think about how do we support them. A lot of times, um, female gender uh, pay parity issues come up very often, right? That's It's a very obvious matter to address, but how are we looking to address them? Right? Um, are we looking to address them from a quota point of view? Say we're looking at a certain- Two minutes left. Yes, Bob. Thanks, Bob. Um, so again, it's really about looking at what these different areas are and coming together as a community to really address them. I think it's also about the changing narrative of HR uh, with business, right? We're moving from administrative to more strategic and proactive. I think often the human capital department is looked at as very administrative and reactive, and that's something we need to change. We also need to look at what does sustainability CSR mean to these Asia, uh, ASEAN companies. A lot of the startups and companies that are growing uh, you know, are looking to figure out what it means to them. And I think having that network of people, not just within human resources, but also within business leads will actually help to foster some of their stance as to what they stand behind. Next slide. Um, so this is sort of what I think, um, you know, this really depends on the HR partners to work with the business owners in Asia and ASEAN as to what ethics, what does equity, diversity, equity, and inclusion, sustainability, and CSR means to them. It should not be just a tick box activity and an IPO requirement. I mentioned this because I think a lot of times in the uh, rush to IPO or in the rush to show that they are compliant, people may not necessarily be doing what is right for the community and for their workers. Um, and that's not what we want. And I think as a function itself, human resources needs to come together to talk about some of the challenges, how they can bend together to make things better for the different countries in which they operate and provide the knowledge to each other. Um, last slide. So um, just want to say thank you to everyone for giving me the opportunity and you can reach out to me via this um, email and LinkedIn. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sri. That's a vast topic and uh, we'll come back, I'm sure, with questions for Sri. Uh, uh, for for example, you know, if I have an ethical problem, would I go to HR to really discuss it, or is it not really the person I would talk to? <laughs> we'll 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 come back to that. So um, this is the, this is really vital about how you manage people, as you can imagine. Now, uh, I'd like to turn to our next panelist, and uh, this is Sharmini Lodasan, Lahodasan, and. Shamini uh, is, has actually the title of ethics in her job. So what does this actually mean? Ethics and uh, you know, compliance, uh, and she's at BP. So welcome Shamini, tell us all about it. What does an ethics manager really do? Hi, Bob. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, it's it's very humbling to be uh, part of uh, this esteemed group. Um, I'll begin with a short introduction about myself. So I am I'm actually a lawyer by training, uh, and I've just recently moved into the ethics and com compliance uh, function uh, as of January this year. So it is a whole new world, but one that's very dynamic and exciting. Um, I'll start with a quick introduction about the company because we, BP, uh, as an organization, is currently undergoing its own change. It's reinventing itself. 
uh, and then I will then share some of the key principles that we will look at or that we work with uh, in building a trust culture within the organization. Next slide, please. So um, we operate in 79 countries. Uh, we have approximately 70,000 employees. Next slide, please. As of last year, we have embarked on a very, very ambitious but challenging uh, but and rewarding journey of reimagining energy for the people in our planet. Um, the ambition is to become a net zero company by 2050, if not sooner. And, and we, we are working with a, a five aim to achieve this net zero ambition. I'm not gonna read it, but it's there uh, on the screen. Uh, some of which would be transparency as a leader. And that kind of feeds into um, the whole ethics and compliance space. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we are moving from an international oil company producing resources to an integrated energy company delivering solutions to customers. Next slide. So what does an integrated energy delivering solutions for customer look like? Uh, obviously one is pivoting from low carbon energy to customer focus, focusing on resilient hydrocarbon business on value, um, delivering the net zero ambition and creating long-term value for shareholders. Um, I'll now move on to the next slide, which will, where I'll spend a bit more time talking about the ethics and compliance aspect of things. There are five elements uh, that we broadly work with. First of all, values made easy. Secondly, be clear with what you stand for. Lead by example, trust me, show me, prove to me, and make integrity a habit. I'll talk to each of these points in turn. So how do we make values? How do you make it easy? Um, we have a set of values and principles which reflect the way we do business and how we aspire to carry out our business. Um, these are set out in a clear and simple manner uh, and it's easily accessible to all in the organization. Explain the why, the what and how the company, company's values and behavior matter to the organization. Be clear for what you stand for. Now, in, within BP, we have a code um, which is simple, easy to understand, and most importantly, it's not just a set of rules. It is a must-read guide um, to do the right thing in the business. And I think there's one important point. It's not just in one specific language. We have translated the code into a number of languages in in a number of the countries, so that it's accessible to employees in pretty much all, if not most of the jurisdictions that we work in and where we operate in. Um, training is undertaken on an annual basis for all employees so that they, A, they have a refresh and they understand what is expected of them within the code. Lead by example, um, personal integrity matters. Uh, no matter how competent or charismatic you may be as a leader, but a business is, is, is trustworthy only as its leaders. So within BP, the tone is from the top, which is critical, and tone from middle management is also critical. To that extent, we provide our leaders with responsible leadership and bonding speak-up training to support them in role modeling ethical behaviors and listening and handling concerns appropriately. I think the two two key points here within this, this heading of lead by example. It's about listening and it's about being a trustworthy leader. The fourth point, trust me, show me, prove to me. There was once upon a time when leaders could just tell the public, trust me to do the right thing. And the public for most parts may listen. However, with increased regulation and pressures from investors, companies are not asked to show and to prove to the public that they are that they have ethical values that are embedded throughout the organization. 
Therefore, we, we have to be transparent and open about our achievements as a good operator, good corporate citizen, and a great workplace. The last point, making in make integrity a habit. Um, leaders who strive to do the right thing under all circumstances know that being trustworthy takes effort, awareness, and hard work. Um, personal character is foundational for interpersonal trust. And as, I think over the years, what we've found is organizations which have leaders with integrity stand a much better chance of building trust from top down and bottom up. Um, I think I can take this opportunity to share a little story that I heard from one of my senior business leaders uh, in one of the jurisdictions in Asia. Um, they were bidding for a specific business um, with a third party. Um, the bid was slightly under compared to other bidders. However, they, they actually won, won the, um, the business, not because of the price bidding, um, but because the third party felt that they could work with VP. Um, it was transparent and there was integrity. So I think having an a ethically compliant organization or people who follow an ethical way of working uh, does pay dividends uh, in the long term, let alone the short term. Um, I, I will stop here, Bob, um, and uh, open up for questions later. Well, we're going to come to the questions after. So uh, the, all of you who have questions for Shamini, uh, please write them and then we'll come back to you, Shamini, on this. But um, uh, it, it's interesting. Can you tell us, however, you know, uh, if they say you're responsible for ethics, do people come to you with ethical questions and say, oh, I have this ethical problem? Or are you just there to implement these, these sort of uh, uh, things that you were talking about before? It's, a, it's both. One is the implementation. The second part is actually discussing and addressing any ethical issues. For example, I've had a senior business leader ask, querying, what do you mean by leadership expectations? Yeah. Um, you would think it is an obvious answer, but it's not as easy as I discovered um, through the in, in, in my attempt to answer that question, it is actually not that straightforward to try and explain to a person, what does leadership expectation mean? Um, what is what is the expected behavior of a leader? Mm -hmm. um, so there are these very intangible or soft, I would say soft skill approach um, that we would need to articulate and uh, help the leaders to better manage challenging situations on the ground where it doesn't relate to um, hardcore compliance of regulatory requirements. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, uh, we'll come back with questions. I can see some questions are being asked on the-, on the Thank you. So uh, we'll get that. Let me turn now to uh, uh, another aspect, which is a very important one that uh, investors uh, are requiring ethics and proof of ethics in companies before they will invest. It's called ESG investment. And so all of the big banks are dealing with this and uh, DBS Bank is, is one of the leaders in the region and they have the uh, a sustainability officer, chief sustainability officer at DBS Bank, Mikkel Larsen. Uh, so the question is really, you know, what is this about? Uh, is, it, is, is, is it increasing this idea of ethical investment? And uh, what are the challenges for the companies? So Mikkel, uh, over to you, please tell us about what, what this is about and is it rising and why are you and what, what is your job? <laughs> Good morning, Bob. Good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm the Chief Sustainability Officer for TBS and but today I'm gonna to tell you a story about the impact that money can make on sustainability and ethics. It might not be obvious, uh, but when you start to think about it, Finance is at the core of pretty much every business decision that has to be made. So therefore, the way that capital and money get moves around and who gets invested in and who gets not makes all the decisions in the world. And the story I'm going to tell you now is of a 
trend that is happening to introduce ESG, environmental, social, and governance considerations into those decision-making, not just in bank lending. In fact, I'm gonna to talk to you more broadly about all types of investment, whether they be loans or more likely equity. So it's not a story particularly about DBS, but it's a story about how money can make an impact. I'll let you make me the judge of it, but uh, of whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, because as you'll see, as I go through this, there is two school of thoughts at this point in time, rather than this is the right thing and we need to do more of it, or other people think of it as a fad. I'll give you my view at the end of this. Next slide. So no doubt, for those of you who follow the sustainability debate, you've heard about this 2.5 trillion investment gap every single year to meet our target by 2030 to meet all of our 17 SGG. And when you think about that, you're thinking, wow, that's an amazing thing. Why are we not just putting all of our money into this? It would be money doing good. And you'll be forgiven to think that. Now, where you will see as we dive deeper into it, it's not quite that easy. Next slide. So this is a very uh, important um, framework for thinking about investment. So if you read this left to right, if you think of traditional investors, if there is such a thing, today you, we think that investors primarily care about the risk of an investment, and the return that they will get, the money that they will get back. But that is starting to change, as I said. And in a simplified way, one step over to the right, you have what we call ESG investment. Here, there are ESG considerations involved, including and on top of risk and, and uh, rewards, risk and returns. So the intention here that this can happen in two ways. Either you have what's called a negative screening, and that means simply that there are certain things you don't want to invest in. If there is nuclear, if there is coal, if there is gambling, different banks, different investors have different definitions, then we wouldn't be investing in it. Other investors have what's called a positive screening. And positive screening means that they will set up their entire investment portfolio. They will only go towards certain earmarked things. Now, if you think about that, that sounds like a good step forward. But just to give you a sense for it, there's a whole industry around this right now, and they provide what's called ESG ratings. Now, you may have read in the press that these ESG ratings are very, very different. So today, there's also something called a credit rating. A credit rating is how risky it is to invest in me. And whether I get that credit rating from one agency or another one, the ratings are broadly the same. There is what we call a correlation of the high 90s, so close to 100%. If you get an ESG rating, the average correlation uh, means how, how, how likely they are to be the same is about 40%, and some of them is down to 10%. In other words, if you're investing based on those ratings, you can get very, very different outcome based on which rating agency you use. So that gives people cause for concern. And especially when you see some of the companies that are being invested in and score very, very high, people get to sense to say, well, they don't resonate as me as being good companies. One step over from that, and that's a very, very big step, is what's called impact investors. This is where companies or individuals start to accept that the most important bit is to create a positive external impact or reduce negative externalities in your investment. So here you either accept a lower return, a higher risk for the same return, or simply say, I'm not gonna get my money back in the short term. I'm gonna put this to work for many, many years. So we've seen some great examples of that happening, investments in schools. We've seen wildlife preservation happening. Um, and that's the next step in the evolution. And then finally, to the far right, we have philanthropy. Now, what you might want to think about is, well, what a wonderful world if we could move everything from the left-hand side of this picture to the right-hand side. But reality is, we will not be able to. And you just think about it yourself. You think about, well, would I put my money and give them away for free? You would not. If this was your own money, 
you would want some level of return on these things. You would want some level of interest because you're putting your money to away when you could have put them some other use. And even if you think of a investor, institutional investor as a big thing, reality is they're managing your my money also. So it's not as easy to say we should all give our money away from free. The challenge is can we move enough money from the left to the right to fill that gap I just mentioned. Next slide. Now, when you hear those trillions of dollars that have gone into ESG investment, you'll be happy and you'll be saying, well, it's a great step forward and it is. But when you look at this graph here, you will see two things that give you cause for wonder. First of all, you will see that this thing about impact investment, which is a subset of that, that's tiny. That's 0 0.4 uh, out of this 20, uh, this 40 billion that is on this slide here, a trillion, 30 trillion on this slide, is a small, small proportion. And secondly, what you will start to see is when you look where the money is going, they are all going to develop countries. So you start to wonder, how do we save the world if all the money is only going towards ensuring that we are not investing in the bad companies and they're all staying in the Western countries? Doesn't sound like we're serving the world. So on the next slide, we don't have time today, but what I normally do when I speak to a group like this, I ask them, if you had a million dollars and you could put them wherever you want to, where would you put them to have the most positive impact on the SDGs? And this is one of those many I did, but it pretty much looked the same all the time. People tell me they want to invest in education. They want to invest in water. They want to invest in reducing poverty. And you see, the problem with this is these are not things that are getting invested in because it's really, really hard to make money out of quality education in sub-Saharan Africa. As I just told you, most of the money is not going to those places. And if you take a deep dive into the SGGs, you will see that most of the problems exist in Southeast Asia, sub-Saharan Africa, and a few other places around the world. And they exist in area where, the dot, where you get most buck for your bank, uh, bang for your buck is an area like poverty and schooling. So what I'm trying to tell you is there's a big difference between what is a need for financing and actually financing flowing in. And that's very simple. That's because the return to a country, the benefit for a country of, of it in investing in private edu in public education is not the same thing as good return for private investors. And that sounds harsh, but that's the reality. So our job is to try and find a way to make it a little bit easier by reducing the risk or increasing the return to get more people to invest into these things, to get you and me to want to put our money there, either directly or through our investment pools. Next slide. Now in DBS, we did a study together with the UN a couple of years back, and we looked only at the green investment agenda here in Southeast Asia. And we found out that just for that part, there was about $3 trillion missing. And if you, that was a few years back. So if you divided that up, that was turned out to be 400, 200 billion a year. And for that, only 40 billion was currently being funded. And if you break it down, so this is to the bottom of this, what you see that back then, when we did this study, almost all of that money came from public finance, the, the 40 billion. And that's not surprising because how do you else do you finance these schools? But if you think about where the future is heading, we estimated that a much larger proportion has to come from private money because simply there's a lot of constraints on public budgets. So if you think of that, you have a big gap in investment already and you need more money to come from the private sector, then that's when we have to change the dynamics to make these things investable. Next slide. So we also did something else. We put on an X and Y graph, what X and Y diagram here, what are the things that are most investable? So if you look at the Y axis, this is how big is the investment need or the opportunity. And on the X axis, you look at uh, what are those that are most easy to finance because they make economic sense. 
And what you will see is that some of these things like infrastructure and renewable energy, money is already pouring in. And that's all we talk about. But you also see that there are some areas which are much, much harder to the far left to finance. Some of them are quite important ones and we're not financing those. And my final slide. So what are we doing in DBS? Now you have to remember that DBS is mainly, mainly a lender. So it's debt for us. What we do is we recognize that in, we focus on many of these 17 SDGs. One of them is climate change. In the area of climate change, what we realize is we have to help people make the transition easier from being what you might call a traditional brown company to a decarbonized green company. And so we set up a transition finance framework that support them through that period, not just saying, oh, if you're not green, we won't finance you or, um, or the other way around, we'll finance everything. We try and give them incentive to move from point A to point B over a reasonable period and with them having given the commitment. That's pretty much the best way we can help them do that. And I'd like to talk more about it in the, in the Q&A if, if you want to. But the idea here is not to demonize. We, there will have to be a hard stop. Some things we will not lend to. We will not investment because otherwise you're not credible as a lender. But we will also try and help getting people from A to B if they have the will, if they make the public commitments and so on. And so when I summarize this on the final slide here, you got to be left wondering, so is ESG investment, final slide, next slide. Is ESG a good thing or a bad thing? I think it very much depends on your perspective on these things here. My own view is that if you think about how we came to investment and to accounting for these things and measurement these things back after the, uh, the Great Depression in 1918, it's taken us 100 years to get these frameworks right. And we're still debating them. With mm -hmm. ESG, we come very, very, very far in a few years. And so in many ways, we cannot throw the baby out with the bathwater. So I'm positive that this is moving us a step in the right direction. However, is it moving us fast enough? I can sometimes have my doubts. Personally, my own areas of focus in SGTs, but that's my private life. I wish it would go faster, but I then I have to put my money where my mouth is and invest in it myself. And so we haven't solved in this webinar here, but what my reach out to you is, think about where you put your money, think about that where you put your deposit can make a difference. Think about that, what you're willing to give up for your savings to make a real impact. And then for that bit that you need to keep really safe and, and at least make them ESG sensible so that you know you can sleep at night. So that was my pitch. Bob. Thank you, Mikael. Very interesting. And I, I think we learned a lot about, uh, particularly about the gap between where the money should be going and where the money actually is going. We have some questions for you, so we'll come back in a minute. But uh, we now come to our last but not least speaker. I've definitely put Aria at the end because I know him and I knew he was he's going to make an exciting presentation. And uh, this is an interesting one because for Tamina, all of you probably know the company. It's a state-owned enterprise. It's one of those companies in energy. So it's like BP, actually, uh, one of the big oil and gas companies. And Ari is going to tell us about how that contributes to the United Nations sustainable, sustainability goals, uh, sustainable development goals. And uh, welcome, Ari, and tell, uh, please uh, take over. Hello, Bob. Thank you very much. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity. It is an honor for me to be here. Honorable speakers, panelists, and moderator, ladies and gentlemen from the audience. Uh, first of all, uh, regarding to the topic of today's agenda, I would like to raise uh, the rise of corporate ethics and how do we balance the purpose of uh, the purpose, profit, and people. I would like to quote how sustainable development from an ethical theory perspective. Next slide, please. Sustainable development seeks to meet the needs of the present without compromising the ability of uh, the future uh, generation to meet their own needs. So it means that sustainable development has included the consideration of social, environmental, and economic dimensions as being inseparable from development. Next slide, please. 
Well, Pertamina, as uh, Bob mentioned earlier, that Pertamina is an Indonesian state-owned enterprise. Our business is in the energy sector. Pertamina has a strategic role to ensure that the, the availability of energy for Indonesia and to energize every sector of life across the country. Next slide, please. To perform such responsibility, Pertamina has developed an integrated business network that covers a range of services from the upstream to downstream. And uh, those are the upstream gas, refinery pen, and petrochemical, new renewable energy, commercial and trading, and also runs the shipping business through its subsidiary, Pertamina International Shipping. I would like to share how uh, Pertamina as an energy state-owned enterprise contribute to sustainable development goals especially focusing on developing the opportunities in the energy and sustainable economic development aspect, as well as mitigating potential risk in the environmental impacts. Next slide, please. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, Indonesia as a member of the United Nations plays an active role in determining the goals of sustainable development goals as stated in the document of trans transforming our world, the 2030 agenda for sustainable development. In order to fulfill the government's commitment in the implementation of the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals, it is necessary to harmonize it with the National Long-Term Development Plan and the National Medium-Term Development Plan. So the government has established policies and regulations as the basis for implementing support for the Sustainable Development Goals in Indonesia. By involving all sectors uh, in, in an inclusive approach, including Indonesian state-owned enterprises. Next slide, please. The Ministry of State-Owned Enterprise has provided clear direction to all state-owned enterprises in Indonesia about creating an action plan in order to support the SDGs throughout its activities, uh, which are in line with the core business of each company. So that with this collaboration, hopefully it can give positive impact to sustainable development goals. As one of the strategic state-owned enterprise in Indonesia, Pertamina continuously supports the achievement of SDGs by implementing programs based on environmental, social, and governance or ESG aspects in its entire operation. In the implementation, the Ministry of State-Owned Enterprise has stated that there are 10 SDG priorities for the state-owned enterprise in the energy, oil, and gas sector. Those are uh, SDGs number one, no poverty, four, uh, number four, quality education, five, gender equality, seven, clean and affordable energy, eight, decent work and economic growth, uh, 12, responsible consumption, 13, uh, climate action, and then 14, life below water, and 15, life on land, and also number 16, peace, justice, and strong institutions. Those priorities are illustrated, uh, the harmonization between Pertamina sustainability goals as an energy company with government's priorities. In addition to the 10 priorities, Pertamina also strives to achieve other SDGs through various initiatives and programs in relation to ESG. Next slide, please. Here, uh, here we have the related to its core business. Pertamina pays attention to the fulfillment of affordable and clean energy, as well as to respond to climate change issues in accordance with government policies to create uh, environmentally friendly energy, Pertamina continues to carry out energy transition initiative, which is in the next slide. Next slide, please. Uh, I would give an overview of the energy transition from the two sides of the story. Uh, the first one is from the core business-based perspective. The new renewable energy portfolio business will grow as targeted in a national energy plan. The renewable energy portion is targeted to achieve 23% in 2025 and 32% in 2050. Pertamina as an energy company will highly contribute to achieve this target. Several initiatives toward green energy such as development of geothermal, which we have uh, developing 1.3 gigawatt geothermal project, solar energy, biofuel, electric vehicle charging and DME. The biggest uh, challenge on providing energy in our country is Indonesia as an archipelago country with uh, thousands of islands spanning across big geographical area. Technically, Pertamina has managed that challenge. So we have seen the development from the industrial side. Now, what about the community? The next slide, please. Now let's take a look about how community development side of the story. 
we believe that in order to succeed the energy transition, we need to introduce the new, the new renewable energy potential in their surrounding area to the community. Under the community development scheme, we have managed to develop the community to understand and utilize those potential energy such as biogas, solar, wind, and microhydro. We also believe that at least there are six added values that can be created, uh, such as energy substitute to reduce the use of subsidized gas, and then energy cost efficiency, employment opportunity, and increase in production capacity, which means a lot uh, as an added value for small businesses, such as home industry. And the use of renewable energy also contribute uh, to sustainable forest program. And of course, related to climate change, the utilization of new renewable energy, such as biogas, uh, which is uh, used for cooking, uh, that we took the methane gas from livestock manure and garbage, it can reduce the impact of greenhouse gas emission. The next slide, please. I would like to conclude that Pertamina has conducted environmental responsibilities regarded as an integrated effort for society living in the surrounding areas of the operation and in a sustainable and synergized manner for wider development. Among others, we have uh, managed the wastewater treatment, reduced greenhouse gas emission, waste, uh, waste reduction program, and the energy management, energy management in Pertamina. Next, uh, the last one. While from the social responsibility side, we have implemented policy regarding social responsibility in accordance to the CSR principle contained in ISO 26000. So the main objective of social and environmental responsibility of Pertamina is to conduct activities that are related to community development and environmental preservation, consistent with sustainable development as uh, to improve the public welfare and be integrated with companies' uh, business activities among others such as uh, safety management, customer engagement, community involvement and development, and also as well the workforce equality. So Pertamina is growing concern on SDGs and ESG integration reflects the company's awareness about comprehensive risk management and its impacts, which can generate positive sentiment for, from the company's uh, stakeholders. So next, the last one, I would like to thank you I believe that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank, Thank you, Bob. You, Aria. So you can see in the slides, there's a lot of details and uh, uh, we, we can see what uh, Pertamian is doing. Why are you particularly interested in doing this job? Is it, uh, why are you working on ethics? Yes, uh, because as I have mentioned in the, uh, the first uh, part of my presentation that uh, it is interesting that how we can connect the three aspects of economic, uh, sorry, environmental, social, and also governance. Those are the base, uh, the fundamental uh, about how do we do our business ethically. So uh, hopefully that we could uh, manage to fulfill the needs for the future generation as well as the uh, current generation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thanks to everyone. Now, uh, we have uh, uh, one of my concerns was are, are we going to be able to get through so many presentations in time? And so you could see that I was like pushing on the time management, and we've done very well, thanks to the speakers for limiting the time, which means that we have question, time for questions and interaction with the audience uh, uh, who has sent in many questions. So I'm going to come back to the, to the same list. In, and start again with uh, Dr. Witt. So we have questions, so please keep your answers rather short. Uh, and if somebody wants to, one of the other panelists has something important to add, a short comment can be, can be added on, uh, but we don't want to spend half an hour on, on one question. So Dr. Witt, this is a question, there, uh, of, of all of them, this is, it seems to be the one that um, we'd like to ask is um, DG, DG, DGTO belongs to a biz, biz, big business group uh, that others look up to, obviously, uh, you're recognized as being very ethical. Do you actively share your experience of company ethics management to other companies in the ASEAN region? And if you don't, uh, would you be doing this in the future? Um, let's, let's, let's see in like this. I think this this panel, this, this is a very great opportunity as a kind of very starting point for us to start talking about the ethics. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in, in ASEAN context, in even especially in Thailand, um, 
we are we are shy about talking about these things because we think that it is something that we we do it, but we we don't talk much about that. Right. So so I I believe that in the future in the Asian community will be op- uh, more opening up about uh, talking on these topics. And then it will be very beneficial for others to to learn from from the challenges and then from the mistakes that we have been through, and then it can do it better. Okay, thanks. Are you um, and are there? Can you give us a specific example of like an ethical uh, business that you're that you're managing in, internally? Um, um, our main major business uh, uh, operation is on the property development, yeah. and and that means we are developing uh, most of the mixed use projects in Thailand, in Bangkok especially, and those will have lots of challenges throughout the supply chain because you have to to talk about um, um, contractors with the workers from 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 neighboring countries. Mm. And how we can take care of their their well being, uh, how they live in the camps, how how their children uh, go for education, and uh, whether there's an illegal um, migrant workers in their camps. So oh, that's a lot of lots of issues that we have to deal with, and also not not to mention about the how we deal with the with the governmental official processes about approval and every uh, and other things. So this is other this other thing that we think uh, is best that we learn from other people who are really in the same industry and really trying to pursue uh, to be to be ethical in this stance. Very important. Thank you, Dr. Vid. Okay, we'll come back to you with other questions. Uh, we have now quite a few questions from Munching at uh, at Air Asia. Uh, I'm going to pick one of them, which is. Um, how does ethics help in developing a good relationship between managers and employees in the workplace? And you know, does the ASEAN Foundation actually have an impact on the on the management system of, of Air Asia? Yes, but I do say that it's not. It hasn't been easy. It's a little bit like moving against this tide, you know. Because in the end, when we do have a lot of people who are concerned about profits, obviously, and they think things like. Corporate social responsibility is something that you do on the side. Um, So what I've been trying to do is to integrate it. And one of the things that has happened recently is that I've also been taken over the sustainability portfolio. And Uh it's not just about something that is done on the side. It has to be fully integrated. So we're looking at climate offset, uh, carbon offsetting. We're looking at uh, gender inclusive policies. We have these things in small doses, but... One of the things is how do we make this across the board a policy? You know, I'm sure everybody has seen all those ads about women pilots in AirAsia, but right. the reality is the percentage is still about 10% of the total. So we need specific policies. So that's kind of what uh, we need to do. Um, and the most important thing is to find champions within the company. So there may not be you know, five directors who will support you, but there may be one. So it's about using the right channels to get some of these policies true. And when, so, so going the other way, uh, it, do you actually get a lot of help from employees uh, on the, on the uh, programs that you're working on that you're funding? Uh, yes. What, what is the impact that that has on them? Oh, definitely it makes them feel a lot more engaged. Uh, so one of the things that we found is that younger employees, they, they value ethics a lot more, I would say. Um, it's important for them to be able to not only work for a company that is ethical, but also to be able to participate in it. So there's a lot more demand for volunteering programs. They want to join me on the trips. So we've done some of these uh, and we have a long running program with different groups of employees. So the other challenge of having a 20,000 people in a group is how do you meet everybody's expectations? So as a growing process, we are working with different types of, so we have some groups working on animal welfare, some groups working on climate change, some groups working on human trafficking, and we pair them depending on their skills. So we have employees actually running our human trafficking training program. They are trained and they go out to train other people. So that gives them a lot of fulfillment. And it's not just about their job. We, we bring them into these other aspects of the business. Mm-hmm. Thank, thank you, Lunche. Okay, let's uh, let's go to some questions for for three. You you there are a num, num, number of them, but here's one that we'd like to 
seems to be very interesting. HR, okay, there's a lot of uh, discussion about whether HR is really ethical or whether they're just administrators. And particularly during the COVID, uh, HR has been responsible for in some case, some many companies for downsizing, uh, et cetera. On the other hand, HR has been involved in, in really frontline work uh, with helping employees from working from home, et cetera. So uh, how would you position HR in its ethical role with the impact of COVID? Has this actually made HR more ethical or has it actually created a gap because HR has to manage uh, the, the, the people aspect of, uh, it, uh, of the cost of the company and therefore reduce employment? Sri, what do you think? Great, great question. Thanks. Thanks, Bob, for that. So I think one of the first things I would say is COVID in itself has been a very challenging situation for many businesses, right? Because it has affected uh, their bottom line. But if I were to take an example uh, from the previous company that I was working for, Gojek, uh, yeah. one of the great things they did was they actually announced, uh, and the decision was made that um, we will be giving up any merit adjustments on salary for employ uh, for within employees in Gojek, and we actually sent the fund towards the foundation to then aid uh, our driver partners in regards to supporting them during these hard times. So um, I think that was a great effort that was made by Gojek. And of course, there, there was a reverse of it as well, right? Where later in the year, despite having done some of these efforts, um, we were still uh, having an impact in regards to you know, our, our business. And so we had to then relook at uh, you know, employability and and the and the workforce. So I think it's it's a challenge, and I do know that because of this, you know, there has to be the dual prong approach where companies do try their best to retain talent as much as they can, and then at the end of the day, that when there is that um, unfortunate decision of having to let uh, you know employ employees go. But having that, having seen this happen, I think one of the scene I've seen is that HR as a function. Uh, really stepping up in terms of supporting these employees as well. Um, I mean, besides the usual sort of uh, retrenchment activity packages or, you know, connecting them with outplacement firms, uh, in many cases, um, employment passes and many other support uh, employee assistance program was extended them way beyond their time uh, just to give them the ability to really, uh, in, in some way or another, be able to elevate um, sort of uh, the, the mental stress that they're going through. Now, having said that, I think we are always, human resources team is always in a difficult position, right? Because um, no matter what you do, and this stuff comes from, and I've discussed this several times, be it compensation, being retrenchment, we, we obviously um, have to be in the forefront of a lot of these conversations. So what if I, I see a lot of HR professionals doing now is to really work with business and how we are going to position position this messaging to individuals as well. So there will always be the continuous sort of push and pull and strain. But I think that's where um, our role is to really come in to look at, uh, you know, being empathetic and, you know, putting on the hat of example, be, do not hire people, massive hire people in a time like this and then massive fire them, which I know I've seen some companies do. So it's really, um, I think, looking at not just the retrenchment part of it, but the hiring, promotion, and the entire talent life cycle. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, let me turn now to, to Shamini. And uh, uh, one question was, why, do you, why are you wearing a mask when you're at the beach with this uh, palm tree and vine? <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> the full answer is I'm not at a beach. I'm actually in the office and okay. and and the re regulations require us to wear a mask. I'm just I'm just using the beach background to it looks great actually. Uh, to to calm oneself and distract everyone online. <laughs> right. So you have the answer to that question, guys. Um, now here's here's a here's a more serious question. Uh, in what aspects does ethics and compliance at BP focus on ex ethical practices at the society level uh, in addition to the environmental sustainability. So you've showed us you know, some of those uh, values and, and things that you have to enforce. I mean, these are behaviors, right? Uh, and uh, it's very difficult to, uh, for an ethics manager to actually change behavior in the company. So maybe you can give us a sort of map of you know, what, is, what is actually on the business of uh, environmental sustainability and green energy and all that stuff 
and what is on the side of actually BP as a company managing people? Right. Um, thank you for that question. So basically, there are two parts to it. And I'll take the second part, which is the ethical behavior aspect within the organization. It is true. And that's what I've discovered very quickly in being three months into the role. Um, the, challenge, the most challenging part is about managing people's behavior, um, getting people to understand what ethical behavior looks like, um, and, and, and getting um, employees to follow through with it. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and also I think there is a slight cultural aspect to it as well in certain jurisdictions, some certain types of behavior may be a little bit more tolerable than others. Um, so that's something we have to be mindful of as well. Um, but there are some basic, uh, well, there are fundamental uh, aspects uh, which are critical for us from an ethical behavior, one of which is respect. Mm -hmm. Respect transcends any culture, <laughs> any religion, any language, uh, and that's core to, to uh, the organization. Um, and, and for example, um, we do not tolerate people shouting at others within the company. If, mm. By way of a simple example, bullying is not tolerated. Mm. Um, and, and, and we also provide avenues for employees, regardless of the levels, for them to raise concerns in a safe environment. Mm -hmm. And we have seen it work um, and confidentiality is ensured. So that gives people the confidence that they need to, to raise concerns uh, with regards to ethical or non-ethical behavior as the case may be. And this is also not just within the organization, but it's also with our business partners um, whom we work with. Um, with regards to sustainable environment, well, we, we have been... Uh, charting our course, uh, not just recently, but over the years. And it is about the partners whom we work with. So uh, the organization is very mindful of the business partners we work with um, and we partner with to develop a more sustainable environment and business partnership. Mm -hmm. Okay. Th thank you for that. Thank you. Okay. Let me now turn to Mikael. We have a, 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 an interesting question here for you. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll read it out. It, it's, your presentation implies that there's an oppositional relation to risk and return and societal in investment, right? So how do you build the, per, per, uh, the perception in your job that this is not just uh, a, a, you know, an either or, you've shown this the spectrum you know, on this side, you're looking at big return. On this side, you're looking maybe not at big return. How do you deal with, with, with clients and, and, and help them to understand that this is not uh, uh, a problem and how do, they, how, do they, how do they find their own ethical investment decisions? No, it is a problem. <laughs> That's what I said, right? Um, yeah. but, but I also said, if you remember the last slide that I presented with the X and Y axis, this is so many things that today are perfectly profitable. The thing that comes to mind for most of us is investing in solar and renewable energy in all kinds. Those are generally proving technology and they're well invested in it. Infrastructure investment. There's so much money that can be going to good use. What I'm saying is that there is a part of it, a large part of it, which still remains difficult to resolve. So how do you resolve that? There are a number of ways this is getting done today. There's the biggest vehicle that exists today is you essentially have the public side and the private side teaming up together. And you have what's called either blended finance or public-private partnerships. In very short, it simply means that if you have some money that is willing to put to risk, the money that is less risky can come in on top of that. Mm -hmm. So while that sounds complicated, it simply means taking the best of two worlds and investing. And that's what you're seeing happening now. And that's raking a real impact. Now, uh, th there's a question. I, I want to be clear on this one. It seems that during the COVID pandemic, ESG investment has boomed. Uh, I saw a figure of 400% growth. Can you tell us the reality? Is this, is, has COVID really caused a, a boom in ESG investment? No, there are many things that are going on at the same time. 
this okay. pickup didn't was wasn't caused by um, COVID, but it wasn't slowed down, and that's a good thing. And you see that also with the green recoveries around the world. I had my own concerns around these things slowing down. It's very natural. Um, but actually, there's another reason. We have to remember when many people think about ESG investment, they intuitively think about green investment. But obviously, ESG investment is also social investment. And the social investment, certainly we've seen just how bad COVID can impact people and creates great levels of inequality. So those types of investment is, should be picking up. But, the, but there is also a little bit of an accounting trick. You know, those people who listen carefully were was, was hearing me saying there's a big difference in how the ESG ratings work. So uh, one of the reasons why this, these ESG investments have picked up is because some of the companies have done well are technology companies and technology companies are less polluting, some of them. Uh, and so companies like that are be doing better and therefore you would see an, an, an increase in the asset under management. Long story short, some of it is real. Some of it has just been a continuing trend. And a little bit is just because of how we define what is sustainable. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Michael. Okay, Aria. Uh, we have two energy companies here. One's a big multinational uh, and one is a big SOE. Uh, the, the thing about the SOE is that you have a mission to provide the energy needs of the, of the fourth largest populated country in the world in a very difficult ge geographical uh, uh, context because of, of so many islands, right? Yeah. Uh, and so uh, if, you, if you look about it, the reason Pertamina was created is because you have energy resources. You have coal, you have iron, uh, uh, oil, you have gas. How are you actually going to, to so this is the question that they have, what, how are you going to actually become a green company, or is this is this really going to happen, or or not? What what what's what's the reality? Yes, thank you, Bob. So, uh, based on the perspective of ethical, how we see the sustainable development, so it, it is uh, declared by, uh, that that uh, it has included the consideration of social, environmental, and economic dimension as being inseparable from the development. So Pertamina as an energy company also focus on the, those three issues as uh, our uh, main agenda about how do we develop uh, green energy uh, for, the, for the sake of the environment. So uh, we are developing also geothermal. As we can see that in Indonesia, we have the biggest uh, potential for geothermal. So that at the moment we are developing a 1.3 gigawatt geothermal project uh, and then also solar energy, biofuel, electrical vehicle, charging uh, station, and DME. So uh, the shifting towards the new uh, new renewable energy is uh, one of the uh, biggest agenda here with us in Pertamina as the energy company. Uh, as, the, as you have mentioned also that we have uh, the biggest challenge is about uh, our uh, condition as an archipelago. So it means that we need to have the complete infrastructure for energy distribution. And for that, uh, we have developed uh, many of our station uh, in the uh, remote area as well, so that we could give uh, the meaning for uh, the real energy for the people in the in the area all around Indonesia. So in that means that uh, we develop uh, developing a green energy is one of our uh, major agenda, uh, Bob. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. We have about 10 minutes for the question and answer. Then I want to come back to the questionnaire. I'll show you the questionnaire results uh, before we, we end our uh, discussion today. Uh, so I'm gonna ask one generic question and any of the panelists can come in and answer it as you, as you like. Uh, and the question is this, uh, we've seen that uh, Davos uh, intends to come to ASEAN for the first time. Uh, as I understand it, it's now been pushed to August. Uh, in which uh, Singapore will, will host the Davis Conference. And that conference theme this year is called Rebuilding Trust. What role can ethics have in helping organizations demonstrate that they can be trusted, particularly in the context of technology? Uh, and so I would like to know from the panelists, uh, you're here in ASEAN, you're working in ASEAN, but you see also that, that around the world, there are other uh, countries, and regions like the European Union, we see this in Japan, these more advanced and developed countries are really pushing the ethical agenda 
So do you believe, what do you believe are going to be the obstacles and what would be the solutions or best practice or best steps to take in ASEAN for companies in ASEAN to become more ethical? And we'll, we'll, we'll have a question on, on the questionnaire to see, to ask the audience whether they believe that there is a problem in ASEAN or not. But I'd like to first address that question to the panelists. Uh, among the panelists, who would like to who would like to address that question? Anybody? And uh, if, if any of the opening speakers would like to address it as well. Do we have a, are we are we ahead? Are we behind? Are we just moving in ASEAN? What is your perception? Hi, Bob. I'd be happy to start. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> One of the big areas that uh, aviation faces is the issue on climate change and carbon emissions. Right. And it has been a very difficult issue because the awareness on climate is so low. So we did a stakeholder assessment on how important is this issue and it yeah. ranks last below everything. So I know that there have been companies, other airlines that have started to do um, voluntary carbon offsetting 10 years ago. And yeah. they ended up scrapping the program because the uptake was so low. So ultimately, the only thing that really works is um, legislation, I have to say. So yeah. in fact, if not for COVID, starting this year, um, airlines uh, that participate in, in the UN agency's uh, program would have to carry out mandatory offsetting starting this year. Okay. And the interesting thing is we are so unprepared for it. Uh, we don't have a working carbon market. There are so few projects that you can get, buy carbon offsets from. Um, it yeah. is a disconnect. So the policymakers agree to join this international scheme, but on the ground, the infrastructure is really not there. So we have to then look at how we can also address it from the private sector point of view. So one of the things I'm looking at to see how we can bring social enterprises into this picture as well, because they are small, but they will really benefit from the carbon offset funding. Um, but it's hugely challenging, you know, to, to get yourself certified and verified. So I think in a sense, in the first step is really legislation and that would in itself bring finance, financial resources into this area um, and definitely a lot more awareness. Thank you, Munching. I'll come back to you also with another question that's general that I, I would like you to lead with, but uh, give me, let, who, would, who else would like to address this question? What are you seeing? Dr. Witt. Hi. Um, I think the key word for, for scaling up the, the practice, the ethical practice and the, the, the philanthropy in Asia, the, the main obstacle is about collaboration. Mm. That I have been witnessed a lot of program that has been redundant. Everyone right. do education, everyone give out scholarship, but they are kind of redundant. So right. I think collaboration is needed for ASEAN communities right now. Thank mm. you. Thank, thank you, thank you. Yeah, and we have one area of collaboration, which is on the political situation of Myanmar, which uh, uh, we need collaboration as well on those, those, those big issues. Okay, anybody else? Uh, yes, Bob. Yes. Yeah. So I think one of the things I do want to talk about is in diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice is really around the fact that um, the challenge that we have in this area is I believe you still hear some people behind closed doors saying that it's a very westernized idea, right? Um, and that all, all denial that we do not have a problem. So I think it's first of all addressing, you know, the fact that there could be um, vulnerable minorities or people within different groups within employee population who, who might be feeling affected or disenfranchised and how do we bring them into conversation? I think it's really the first step would really be to create conversations where people can be themselves. And this is in all aspects. Um, again, another a, a group that I feel that's often not looked upon, for example, disability, Right. Yeah. Uh, but in Hong Kong, uh, to the point uh, that uh, was brought up earlier by Man Ching, I think legislation really helps because in Hong Kong, they made um, disability hiring sort of a mandate in many organizations. And that has actually pushed forward the agenda. So I do feel that some form of legislation would actually help uh, in terms of, you know, it could be on, on a female employees and senior leadership, or it could be on disability, even on LGBTQ. But of course, that's a very, very fine line to to right. walk through 
And I know that is going to be um, a journey. It's not going to be something that we're able to turn around within uh, just a couple of conversations, but at least taking the first step, I think, is key to moving the needle on uh, anything that's got to do with DEIJ. Yeah, we hear a lot about governance and then what both of you are saying is that we need more laws. And that's one of the difficulties that we see in ASEAN is uh, the, the laws in each country are so different that it's very difficult to sort of come together and, and have something that uh, the countries will agree on. And so it doesn't happen. And then you, you fall behind compared to the other places where you can pass these kinds of laws. Was there anybody else that wanted to comment on this issue? Aria? Yes, thank you, Bob. So I would like to address about how do we build the community independency uh, since we have yeah. uh, discussed about the collaboration, social entrepreneur and the climate change yeah. issues. Uh, we see that there are also opportunity when we touch the community itself, uh, themselves to have the community independency. So we move together with the community. Uh, since in Indonesian case, we have a lot of potential for new renewable energy in our area. Uh, it, it lies uh, right uh, next to them so that if they know how to uh, uh, about what kind of energy and how to manage that and how to utilize that, I believe that we could develop uh, the community independency so that it could give uh, added value for their economy as well. Yeah, Thank you. that's very important. It's obviously, obviously this whole issue of behavior and how do we uh, improve behaviors and ethical behaviors. Uh, I want to come back to Mun Munching because you were going to talk about this and it came up in one of the questions. Uh, there's another issue which is, uh, you know, and, and following what Sri was saying, I've also heard from people to say, oh yeah, human rights, you know, that's a Western values thing. You know, we have our own values in ASEAN. Uh, but then it comes to the United Nations uh, issuance, the 2011 uh, uh, issuance that, uh, uh, which is that, uh, companies are responsible for human rights and slavery in the value chain. And you mentioned that you're doing something about this, right? Right. Yes. Um, yeah. I think I mentioned earlier, I used to be a journalist. So I used to report a lot on human trafficking, migrant exploitation in, in Malaysia specifically. And then- Is that a specific I, problem of ASEAN, by the way? Yes. Uh, it, I mean, ASEAN is the biggest hotspot for human trafficking. 25% of victims come from this region, right? Nice. So after I started at Radio Foundation, I met up with one of my old friends and then she said, look, we have been rescuing people uh, from Africa. They are girls from Uganda who are being yeah. trafficked for sex in Malaysia. I was thinking that is so weird. I, I just cannot yeah. make that connection. And in their interviews, they discovered that the girls were actually smuggled in from Kampala to Southern China to Guangzhou, where there is a big African community. And then they are put on AirAsia flights to fly into KL oh. or via First, they go into Bangkok first, and then from Bangkok, they get sent to KL. And once they reach KL, they are put into specific hotels that specifically cater to a Middle Eastern market. It's right. totally something we didn't expect at all. So she asked us whether we could do two things, because these girls, when they were smuggled, they started to realize something was wrong on the flight. They, they, they were informed that they were coming to KL to work as domestic workers. And, you know, if you're from this area, you know, we don't have African yeah. domestic workers. Yeah. So... They asked for two things. One is if you could train our staff to recognize the signs of trafficking and, and, right. and to know what to do. And the second, whether we can put materials on board uh, so that people will know if they need help, who to call. So we managed to tackle the first one. So we implemented a training program where we got our staff to volunteer to be trainers. We got them trained by experts and they then now train our frontline staff. So our cabin crew, ground staff, security staff are all trained. Now COVID threatened to upend all of that because we did about 1,500 people. So what we did was we moved the entire thing online. So we now have a, a, a online training module to deal with that. And the, the benefits of online, of course, it, you lose the whole direct touch thing because this is the thing that people do not necessarily like to talk about. So when we actually did face-to-face -face training, we get a lot of anecdotal, anecdotal information. Majority yeah. of staff would have seen something that made them feel uncomfortable, but they didn't know what to do with them. Of course, we lose some of that connection, but the scale is different. So with classroom training over one year, we trained 1,000 people, 1,500 people. With online, within two months, we managed to reach 7,000 people. So there are some pros and cons. So the next step when we start again is really how do we get the information out? So one of the challenges is there's so little collaboration in ASEAN. We don't even have a single anti-trafficking number that everybody uses. So everybody right. has to 
number. So how do we communicate that? So that's the next step of the challenge that we are looking at. Thank you. Very interesting. Thank you, Muching. Well, I'm looking at the clock and it looks like we're out of time for the question and answer period because we, we have to uh, then uh, go to the questionnaire. So uh, can, can, can the AUN team help me with uh, the questions? We have a, just a very few questions. Okay, I need to make it really big so that we can read it. Okay, so the first uh, question, can, can we just make that one slide as big as possible on the, on the slide so everybody can read it? Yeah, that's great, okay. So the first question was, uh, you know, what, who, who is out there? Uh, we have a number, we have hundreds of people that have come in and, and, uh, and, and a lot of people will want to see the recording as we've seen. Uh, some people even contacted me about from Africa and from uh, the US and Canada that, that were interested in this uh, theme. Uh, but here we see that 54%, uh, uh, I guess that's the academician. So these are professors or what? Can, can somebody help me interpret this? The red, which is the, about half of the population, the red is a, a, a academician. academician, yes. Okay. What do you mean by that? Because you've got instructor and professor down there. Um, I think because we also have option for them to, you know, um, okay. if if there's no choice, um, they can also feel free to field um, the okay. other occupation. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. And then the next biggest one, as we can see, is the blue one, which is the students. And then uh, employees, we have quite a number of people from companies as well. So it's a very interesting mix and, and, and uh, um, thank you for that. So now we know who's asking. And then let's go to the next question, which is what's the age group? Okay, and uh, the blue is very small. So under 20 is very small. 21 to 30 is the red, which is this one, right? 30%, right? So a lot of student uh, level or entry level uh, employees uh, uh, actually make up the biggest segment of our, uh, of our audience today. Second biggest segment is the orange, so 30 to 40, so we have a young population. Then it comes to 40 to 50, 18%, and then uh, the purple is 51 to 60, 61%. So that's uh, sort of the breakdown of who's been tuning into our ethics discussion. Let's go to the next one. So this is a this is a really uh, important question. Is uh, do do you agree? Companies have become really more ethical. So I get one, two, three, four, five. But what does this mean? What is the five? Can you tell us what the five? Uh, the five is strongly agree. Yeah. Is that I what it is? Strongly agree. Yeah. Five is strongly agree. So uh, we we have some that strongly agree. Uh, of course, this would be strongly disagree, I would suppose, right? The one. Yeah. So everybody sort of sees some, some evolution to uh, companies becoming more eth ethical. And the, the number four, well, three and four, but four is quite high. So uh, agree, I guess, is, is the next one, right? And then this is somewhat agree, right? So in this area, we've got the lot, we've got, uh, you know, 90% more. Uh, would see the positive side uh, of an evolution of companies to become more ethical. And I think that's really what this uh, panel has helped us to understand is not only is ethics an attitude or sensitivity, uh, it's not something that's coming from the outside. It's something that is actually being managed inside companies with people that have specific roles uh, to play in terms of uh, corporate ethics. So that's an interesting finding. Let's go to the next one. Do you agree that compared to international companies operating in the region, so we have one of those, which is BP, uh, and ASEAN companies, which are all the other companies that we have here, as ASEAN-based companies, are they good or better? So again, help me with the, uh, we can see the same kind of, uh, 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 progression, right? Most are in the three and four. And what does this mean? I, I, I agree and somewhat agree. Is that what this is strongly? Yeah, three would be agree, uh, four would be somewhat agree. Mm -hmm. Okay. So here the perception is that uh, the ASEAN countries are as good 
or better than the international or multinational companies operating in the region. Uh, we have some disagreement here, strong disagreement or disagreement, but uh, uh, in, in fact, um, or we had one that was don't, don't know, right? Which one was the don't know? Was that number one? No, sorry. We don't have don't know in this one. We don't have, okay. Mm. All right, so we can see a trend that uh, not only are, are companies becoming more ethical, but companies in ASEAN are holding their own and uh, doing a good job on, the, on this transition to becoming more ethical as well. Let's go to the next question. In your opinion, what's the number one ethical priority for ASEAN companies? Uh, and here we have 28% uh, is the blue, so that's CSR, right? Comes out to become the most important, thank you. Then sustainability is, no, the 21% is the purple, defining a corporate purpose beyond profit. Uh, and then the red one is sustainability. And then we go to workforce diversity and inclusion, which is uh, quite, quite high. And then reducing corruption. Uh, and then the yellow is human rights. So uh, it's interesting because uh, we see that, that all of them are important, right? And in this case, I think we had, uh, you, we, we forced you to choose what's the number one. So in some cases, even the human rights issues, which is the smallest one here, was chosen as number one by some of the participants. So it's a good spread, which means that this gives us a bit of a map to show where we should be discussing and, and with this initiative that we have uh, between the ASEAN University Network, the Human Rights uh, Reporting Organization and the ASEAN Human Development Organization. We were the first ones to start talking about it. Now we're talking with other organizations like the ASEAN CSR and the ASEAN Business Advisory Committee, we have a sort of map on where the priorities are and what we should be talking about in the future. Next question. That's it. We're done. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, we have uh, five minutes left for the uh, remarks by the moderator. Well, it's going to be impossible for me to synthesize what this brilliant uh, panel has been able to say. However, I think what we have seen are, uh, number one, that we have professionals inside companies whose function is to promote ethics in different ways, number one. Number two is they seem, they, they know what they're, they're, they're doing. So you're going from general principles and what is going on in the rest of the world, uh, such as questions of sustainability, which is one that's becoming more and more important. Um, uh, for everyone. Uh, and so we have people that are, that are working on them. And what we have seen, I think that specifically ASEAN from our panelists are um, what, uh, what, we can, uh, what we can say is uh, that we've seen that there's a lot more cooperation and a lot more communication on how we can work together in the future. Uh, would any of the panelists like to say, to, say, uh, to answer this question? What is the message, if you have just one short message, what's the message that you would give to the audience now that you know something about who's listening and watching uh, about what uh, the future? What's the most important takeaway for you uh, from this particular discussion? Dr. Witt, may I begin with you? Thank you. My, my last message would be following your heart do whatever you see is important and then it's uh, benefit others. Thank you, Dr. Witt. Moon Ching, I'm just gonna go down the list in that case. Well, definitely you have, to, you have to be conscious of what you are doing yourself and how you consume and how you, you manage your own responsibility, but it's also equally important to express that. So panels like this uh, need to be more frequent so that companies will start to take notice as well. So it does depend on customers to start making their voices heard. Okay, thank you, Munchi. Shri. So I think for, for myself, and I mentioned this when I was speaking about how the younger generation is really demanding the equilibrium for, for, for rights and obligations for their employers. So I think I would say continue to be that sounding board to, to the various companies that you're working for, even if you're starting up your own firm, uh, for, be that voice of reason 
voice out your concerns, talk about this. And I think it's always conversations that actually kick off um, inspiration that actually gets people to call to action. Thank you. And as you're the HR person, are, would you encourage people to find jobs uh, in, you know, we have a lot of young people, uh, to try to find a job in ethics? Is that, is that, a, is that a market today? Um, I think it's a slowly growing market, right? I mean, is, is it? there's definitely room for it. And I think in a lot of roles, um, especially the roles dealing with people, I think there's, there's a lot more room for this. And you see this becoming, in any role that you're in, I think this is something that you hold to as a high regard. Uh, so I think definitely if they're interested in it, um, and I'm happy to speak with anyone who would want to talk about it and, and look out for such roles as well. Fabulous. Charmini. What's the takeaway? Hi, Bob. Thank you. Um, recognizing uh, and respecting the fact that we do have issues that need to be addressed, speaking about it, continuing to, continuing to engage. And I do agree with a couple of the previous speakers who um, identified the need for legislation, uh, as painful as it may sound, but that is the reality within the ASEAN space. Thank you, Charmini. Mikael? Don't know if we lost him. Mikael, are you still there? If not, I'll jump to Aria. Yes, thank you, Bob. So uh, my uh, statement was, uh, let's do good things. Let's collaborate for sustainability. Right. That's all, thank you. Thank you. And, and our opening speakers, I'd like to ask you, what do you think this is the takeaway? You've been listening. So I see Fuka with your picture up there. Can you? Okay, any takeaway? What 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 do you conclude? Maybe we've lost him there. Thomas Thomas, are you there? Uh, yeah, I'm there. I'm here. I must uh, say it was a very interesting session. That's why I'm surviving, standing up for the two and a half hours. Uh, the, I think the first one point is um, is ethics is something that has to be embedded in the value system. Yeah. And, uh, from the speakers, there's quite clear indication that those value systems are there, but at the same time, how to apply those value systems. So I think if you, um, what we heard very positively was that that value system of ethics is seen reflected in many actions, whether it's diversity, whether it is looking at forced labor, whether it is trying to address environmental issues, it's something. But, um, and the other point from my own experience and our own studies actually tells us that there need to be more guidance on what right. is ethical behavior and what is not ethical behavior, what is acceptable behavior. And uh, our business integrity study shows clearly that when there is regulations, when there are clear guidelines. So possibly uh, the next follow-up that I do if you would suggest is, is getting people to know what are the norms, what are the acceptable norms and behaviors to make it ethical. And unless we are ethical, we are not going to build trust and uh, uh, have many other things in place. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, and, and I'd like to turn to my co-founders. Uh, however, I did get a message from Marzuki because uh, as uh, some of you may know, he was the reporter for the United Nations on the Myan on, on Myanmar. So he's, he had to drop off to go to a meeting on, on Myanmar this morning. Uh, but Choltis, are you still there? I don't know if he had to drop off or if he's there. Choltis? No, so then it's up to me <laughs> to say the concluding remarks. Well, I, I think, uh, um, you don't know uh, you don't know me, but the reason I'm in this part of the world is because I find uh, this part of the world the most fascinating right now. And the changes that are happening are uh, happening very quickly. And I believe that uh, the reason I got involved in this is because I believe that uh, people from companies uh, and companies themselves uh, provide a very strong force for change if they are oriented in that in that way, and I think that's what we're we're what we've shown in this particular panel is that companies are investing a great deal to take responsibility for that in a very important 
period in which this next generation that is taking over ASEAN will be, uh, will be uh, very different because it's going to be actually a global leadership position that we are taking. And without ethics and without a clear idea of what, what is the right thing to do, we won't be able to do that, particularly given the dynamics that are here in ASEAN where you have uh, almost a Cold War kind of situation coming with many value systems uh, being uh, played out in, in uh, Asia Pacific uh, as, as it is. So uh, it's, it's an important discussion. We will continue it. Thank you for the questions that you've answered on the questionnaire. Thanks so much to the panel. It was really a brilliant group of people that we have here. And I'd like to now turn this over to the Master of Ceremonies uh, for, for the follow-up. Hi, okay. Um, so I just wanna conclude by saying that this webinar on the rise of corporate ethics has been an in extremely informative webinar. The AUN Secretariat wants to sincerely thank all the speakers for sharing their views on this topic and to Dr. Bob for being such an incredible moderator. We would like to express our sincerest gratitude to our wonderful audience who have been participating so diligently and asking some really great questions. Before, this, before we end this webinar, I would like to request the audience to fill out the survey. The link is in the comment box uh, in, on the YouTube live and on the Zoom chat. And through this link, you will be able to request a certificate if you wish to do so. And also I would just like to remind everyone that want a certificate, please fill out your full name and your email correctly so that there are no mistakes there. Since this webinar is recorded, feel free to check it out on the AUN YouTube channel. And we do have another webinar coming up really soon on, on another really great topic. So that is it for today. And once again, thank you for everyone. Thank you to everyone for tuning in. And it has been really wonderful. And we hope to see you again next time. Goodbye. Thank you, Divani. Good job on the Master of Ceremonies. Pleasure to work with you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you.